us all rise, please. Folks, we're coming up on uh, what I think is the most important uh, days in history. And we're, what we're going to recognize this weekend with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Savior of the world. So uh, let's, let's honor our God today in, in this prayer. And I'm going to I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray, pray a poem. So bow your head, please. Little baby on the hay, soon there'll be another day when nails will pierce your hands and feet as you deliver our sins defeat. Risen Jesus on the throne, we lift our prayers to you alone, for you're the gift that we all receive, the hour that our fathers believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And let's uh, pledge, uh, Mr. Adam. I Mr. pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Is that okay? That's on. Okay, uh, we're going to pause our announcements, uh, and we have a uh, a resolution. And uh, Catherine or uh, Mr. Secretary, I've got I've got it. Um, good morning, commissioners. As as you all know, um, we, we lost a dear member of our. PSC community and uh, Paul Zimmering, who was a mentor to many of us, myself included. Um, Paul's wife Martha is here with us. And um, Martha, I, would you would you mind coming up front? We come up and uh, have a seat up front, Martha. Yeah. <laughs> we made Paul sit there a few times. <laughs> but we've got a resolution uh, honoring him. Um, you all signed it, we're gonna have it framed and, and I'd like to read the resolution uh, for everyone. This is resolution number 02-2024. Resolution to express condolences upon the passing of Paul Lewis Zeke Zimmering and to further express gratitude for his services to the Louisiana Public Service Commission. Whereas the members of the Louisiana Public Service Commission and staff were saddened to learn of the passing of Paul Zimmering on March 4, 2024, and whereas Paul earned a Juris Doctorate from Tulane Law School where he was a member of the Tulane Law Review in 1976, and shortly thereafter embarked upon a nearly 47-year career with the Stone Pigman Law Firm, and whereas Paul, as a member of the Stone Pigman Law Firm, served as special counsel to the Louisiana Public Service Commission for the majority of his professional career, representing the commission both at the state and federal level, and whereas Paul was an ever vigilant advocate for the commission in hundreds of dockets with his actions saving ratepayers of Louisiana utilities billions of dollars, and whereas Paul was instrumental in his role as special counsel in the drafting and passage of numerous LPSC rules and regulations that to this day govern the practices of utilities in Louisiana, and whereas Paul was always at the forefront of forward thinking and new ideas in utility regulation, and whereas Paul had the unique ability to summarize the most complicated legal and policy issues in terms anyone can understand on his famous cheat sheets, and whereas Paul not only taught courses on energy law and regulation at Tulane Law School, he likewise served as a professor to both LPSC commissioners and staff over his many years of service, including allowing staff members to audit his classes, and whereas Paul essentially created a treatise on utility regulation that served as an orientation manual for new LPSC commissioners and staff alike, and whereas Paul gratefully and patiently served as mentor to countless persons associated with utility regulation, embarking wisdom and knowledge through his calm demeanor. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Louisiana Public Service Com Commission does hereby express its deepest sympathies and sincere condolences to the family of Paul Lewis Zeke Zimmering, and does hereby offer best wishes, hopes, and prayers for comfort to those who mourn his passing. Be it further resolved that the Louisiana Public Service Commission does hereby direct that the Commission's law library be named the Paul L. Zeke Zimmering Memorial Law Library to forever honor his legacy of legal teaching at the Commission. Be it further resolved that a suitable copy of this resolution be transmitted to Mr. Zimmering's family. Martha, we thank you. I'm, uh, you know, I was under Zeke tutage for almost eight years, and uh, it's been a blessing. It's a very complicated business. Needs a very, he was a very wise man. So, uh, from me to you, I really appreciate it. I, you know, I candidly uh, told.
talked about Paul, and I, I said, uh, up to this day, he's my favorite Jew, okay? And, uh, and uh, we, we loved him, and we miss him. So uh, thank you for sharing him with us. Thank you, Commissioner yeah. Campbell had something else. Did you want to say something? No, it's on. It's on. I uh, told you earlier I had a son-in-law that you that Paul taught at Tulane, a boy named Jack Casanova. And uh, I asked him about your husband. I said, How, what do you think about Paul Zimmer? How, how nice he, he said, I never had a professor that's, that's as nice as he was. He said, I learned a lot, but he was polite. He respected everybody. I, I said, so what does that mean? A plus, A plus. So that's from a student. And uh, when I was a student, I don't know that I gave many teachers an A plus, but uh, he did. He said he was a gentleman, he learned a lot, and Paul was always nice. That's, that's how I, when I met with him. There's a lot to say about humility. I don't have enough of it. It's the greatest thing a man or a woman can have is humility. If you can be humble, that's a great thing. I wish I had a lot more of it. Paul was humble. He was smart and humble. That's something you don't always see. A lot of smart people wear it on their sleeves, and they tell you how smart they are. He didn't have to do that. You knew it. So I'm sorry. Uh, for him and you, uh, but one thing I loved about him, Paul was a loyal Democrat, and so am I. So am I, and so I, I, uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> Chairman, I'll go. Okay, Miss Martha, I, I, I told you um, as the newest one. Um, as the as the newest commissioner, I, I probably spent a lot of time with him over this past year. And he was always willing to take my calls as, a, as an eager freshman of the commission. Uh, he made me and my staff binders and then was e equally impressed when he learned that we actually read those binders that he made. Um, and and my, my, my favorite memory of, of Zeke was we were in Canada, a short, a short meeting, and he found out about my love of hot dogs. And I received this package in the mail to my house. And I was like, what is this? And it said Zeke. So I assumed it was a, another, another binder. And it was a hot dog shirt. <laughs> and, I, and I now have that hot dog shirt. And, and he, has, he had a note in it. And so I'm going to put that hot dog shirt in a frame and his note in my office and keep it. So every time I do this work that I'm doing, I can think of him and his memory. And so uh, my condolences to you. Uh, and your family, but as uh, I was always taught, just know that he did his best. Uh, he passed his test, and now he is claiming his rest. We loved him. Yeah. Yeah. Ray? Yes. It's on. Martha, I want to uh, say thank you for sharing your husband uh, with us and with me. He was a mentor for sure, and um, what I value the most about him is he seemed to be the smartest guy in the room. And yet he would somehow make me think it was my idea when we arrived at it. So um, he was truly a gentleman and a scholar and uh, someone I'll, I'll think often, what would Mr. Z do? So thank you again for sharing him with us. Martha, uh, thank you for taking the time to come up here today and learn about how everybody in this room felt about Paul. And it's not just about the commissioners. As probably as you walk through this room today, you got to experience a whole new layer of folks that thought the world of Paul. And, you know, uh, for me, you know, it's been a great joy of my life for the last 15 years to work with all the attorneys and uh, consultants in this room. But, you know, they're just going to have to bear the burden of understanding that they just weren't that smart and to understand how small how smart Paul was and uh, you know it's really interesting when you can you know uh, be a, a, a well a fellow alum of Tulane you know and you know sit down and get right down to the the, the real roots of issues with someone and 
have him really educate you in a way that is meaningful and strong and helpful to really understand the unbelievably complex issues that this place is dwells in the depths of. And Paul really had the knack, and that's a hard thing to do. And you know, I, I see people in this room who are brilliant and they struggle to get past the, the high level and get it to the point where you know, we can really you know, get a feel for it. And you know, I'm, you know, I absolutely find myself thinking now about how to you know, get this down to the outline level that you know, Paul would have done. And so that's a lesson learned. And I think it's an important thing for all of us to know is that Paul did not just tell us what to say, he taught us what to say. And so what we find now is that the commission is going to take his handbook. We are going to expand on it. We are going to create a treatise and it is going to carry his name on it for the future. And we're gonna find our way to do that through the commission and we're gonna find our way to do that through the State Energy Bar Association. So I want you to know that he's gonna have a long legacy for that as well as the obvious case law. There's gonna be educational components for him in the future. And lastly, I just wanna say thank you for sharing with him with us for all these years because we know he put in a, a lot of billable hours on the commission. And we, you know, we'd appreciate that and we know you do too. But thank you for being here today and you know, we're here for you anytime you need us. So thank you. I uh, would not have missed it for anything. Hang on a second, he's gonna turn that on. I'm gonna turn that mic on, all right. Thank you. Uh, I would not have missed this meeting for anything. And all I can say is that uh, Zeke really enjoyed working with all of you, both professionally and personally. Um, he did it for a long time, and it really, really was fulfilling to him. So I thank you all. Thank you for coming, Bob. Thank you, Martha. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Announcements. Uh, we need to, uh, sorry. I think we need to adopt the resolution. Can we okay. We, I'm sorry. Can we, we, we need to officially adopt the resolution. Can we have a motion we adopt the resolution? Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Second. Second. Okay. Any objection to that? And hearing none, it's adopted. Yes. Uh, and uh, announcements uh, start with thing. Mr. Campbell. I, uh, I want to say a, a little bit uh, about. Uh, Mr. Green's father, he passed away. Tom Green passed away, and uh, his services are sat uh, fr Friday, I understand. But I served with Tom Green uh, eight years in the Senate. He beat a good friend of mine uh, that I had started with. Tom Green never told anybody, but I think it's right. I think he had a doctor's degree in nuclear engineering, is that correct? Masters, yes. It was, a, it was heavy. But anyway, he never told people about that. Uh, he's a veterinarian. Uh, he was a humble guy. We've talked about two humble people today. Uh, maybe a little bit of a wear off on me. I've heard myself talk about it twice. But he was a great guy. Uh, got along with everybody, nobody. Had, I don't think he had an enemy. I don't know he, if he did, it wasn't in the Senate. Uh, he, he was always uh, very strong for what he believed in. A lot of times I would look up there and uh, if he was really strong for something, even if everybody was, maybe a lot of people were voting another way, Tom Green voted his conscience. Uh, that's something that all politicians ought to try to follow. That's not enough of that today. Too much today of people going one way and they don't have the courage to stand up and follow their own conscience. And when you do that, everything's always better. But I uh, send my sympathies to you and your family, your mother, uh, your brothers and sisters. Uh, they're a big family, nice people, 
Tom Green was a gentleman and a nice, humble man. A very, very nice looking guy. I don't know if you ever knew Tom Green. <laughs> it was, he was really handsome. A handsome guy and a big guy. He had every all the answers, smart, big guy, handsome, and humility. So it's real hard to put that on uh, a person. Uh, he sat right next to another guy in the Senate, <laughs> sort of a same kind of statue. This boy that's named on the football field out there, Tommy Casanova. Tommy Casanova was from Crowley. It looked like a movie star. And he and Tom Green sat right next to each other. So uh, they were both humble, nice people, and they were best friends. So anyway, Craig, tell your mother and all your brothers and sisters that we're thinking about them. Your daddy lived a great life. He helped a lot of people. And he, he didn't wear any of his attributes on his sleeve. He didn't tell you how smart he was, uh, any of that. So that's great for everybody to think about today when politicians brag on themselves and this, that, and the other. Uh, it's nice to see that some people can achieve things without patting themselves on the back. So I'm uh, really sorry to hear about his passing. He was a gentleman and a man's man. A man's man. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Um, spent a lot of death recently. I had a, a younger partner of mine pass away unexpectedly. <coughs> another orthopedic surgeon about my age. And then uh, my dad, we had been expecting for a while, but for something that's so ubiquitous, if you're lucky enough to have a great dad that he dies, is still difficult. Um, so I appreciate all of y'all's support. I thank you for all the comments. Um, you know, my dad taught me a lot, and, and part of what I do in politics is because what he did, we believe in citizen democracy. Normal people should serve in office. And when he finished the Senate, he went right back to veterinary medicine. Um, it was not who he was, it was what he did. Um, I consider him to be a servant and a statesman. And if you ask me what my political aspirations are, they're to be the exact same, um, is to be a servant of the people and a statesman. And uh, what I'm most uh, appreciative of in you know, 30 years later, in the heat of the moment, you can, people can attach issues and people and connect them. Um, even now, I've accumulated enemies because of, we may disagree on an issue. But he was very good at separating the issue from the person. And just like in our faith, you can love the sinner and hate the sin. You could disagree on an issue and still break bread or be nice and respectful. And he was, I think he was really good at that, and I think uh, Foster will agree to that. And that's something I aspire to as well, as, although I, I get tested by it at times, especially during my re-election right now. But um, it was death of a hero, and the baton has been passed. And thank you for all your prayers and support. Appreciate it. OK, we have some other announcements. Love God one. Uh, next month, we'll be gathering together. and. Uh, the great uh, Lake of Toledo Bend, up at uh, called Cypress Bend, I believe that's so. Yes, sir. So we got to bring your golf clubs and your fishing pole, and, uh, and bring your shorts and flip flops. It's going to be a casual dress. We're going to start at 10 o'clock instead of 9, so uh, everybody have a chance to uh, sleep a little bit late and uh, <laughs> get on and maybe get a get, quick round of golf before the before the meeting, so I'm really looking forward to it. It's This is in my area. I'm actually, we're sneaking a little bit across the line. We're over in uh, Foster Camel's area. Uh, uh, Camel and I have the privilege of, uh, of serving all the uh, border of the Louisiana side of the lake, and uh, it's a great place. Uh, remind you all, there's a uh, some green uh, electricity up there. We've got a, uh, a generator on the dam. It's about 60 megawatts or thereabouts. And, uh, so we're glad to have that much uh, green energy in Louisiana. So uh, appreciate all of you seeing your smiling faces up there. Any other announcements? Uh, seeing none, let's go ahead, uh, Ms. Ms. Catherine. Uh,
Exhibit yes, one or two, I mean. Exhibit number two is docket number T36975. It's the commission versus fast affordable college student movers on an alleged violation of general order dated July 12th. 2013 for failure to provide a written estimate prior to conducting moving services general order dated july 1st 2021 as amended by exceeding rates as outlined in the company's tariff dated july 22nd of 2022 while operating under common carrier certificate number 7823 allegedly having occurred on or about june 28th 2023 through june 29th 2023 and advertising under a name other than the carrier's legal and or registered name pursuant to general order dated april 3rd 2008 as amended this is a discussion and possible vote pursuant to rule 57 on an affidavit and stipulation executed by the carrier, so we'll need two votes. As a result of the complaint submitted to transportation staff, a citation was issued to fast affordable college student movers on September 13th of 2023. In response to the citation, the manager of the company executed an affidavit and stipulation on behalf of the company admitting to, the, to violating all the violations in the citation. And in that affidavit and stipulation, the carrier agreed to the imposition of a $10,000 fine and $25 citation fee with $6,000 being suspended contingent on certain conditions in the affidavit and stipulation. Staff recommends that the commission one, exercise its original and primary jurisdiction under rule 57 to consider the affidavit and stipulation and two, accept the affidavit and stipulation executed on March 6, 2024 for fines and fees totaling $4,025. We move to uh, take this up into rule 57, exhibit number two. A second. Second from uh, Commissioner Lewis. Uh, make a motion that we accept the uh, staff recommendation Exhibit number two. I'll second. Second by Mr. Lewis. Is there any discussion or objection? No, number two is passed. Number three. Exhibit number three is docket number T37084. It's the commission versus pack that and go movers. It's an alleged violation of Louisiana revised statute 45161 through 180.1 by engaging in activities related to moving household goods prior to complying with the requirements of revised statute 45164E and general order dated March 16th, 2021 and for failure to comply with the requirements of general order dated April 3rd, 2008 as amended. It's a discussion and possible vote pursuant to rule 57 on an affidavit and stipulation executed by the carrier, so this will also need two votes. As a result of the complaint submitted to transportation staff, a citation was issued to the company on December 29th, 2023, and in response to that citation, the operation manager of the company executed an affidavit and stipulation on behalf of the company admitting to violating all violations alleged in the citation. In the affidavit and stipulation, the carrier agreed to the imposition of a $1,000 fine and a $25 citation fee with $500 being suspended contingent on terms in the affidavit and stipulation. Staff recommends that the commission, one, exercise its original and primary jurisdiction under Rule 57 to consider the affidavit and stipulation and to accept the affidavit and stipulation executed on February 23rd, 2024 for fines and fees totaling $525. Moved did we take up uh, exhibit three under Route 57. Second, Second by Commissioner Greed. Uh, I'll make a motion that we accept the uh, staff recommendation on exhibit number two, I'm number three. Uh, I'll second. Second by Commissioner Lewis. Uh, any objections or discussions? Hearing none, exhibit three is passed. Number four. Exhibit number four is docket number S37089. It's IM Telecom doing business as Infinity Mobile. It's a petition for their designation as an e eligible telecommunications carrier within the state of Louisiana for the limited purpose of offering wireless lifeline services. It's a discussion and possible vote on staff's report and recommendation. On December 29th of 2023, Infinity Mobile sought the commission to designate them as an ETC and their notice, was notice of the request was published in the commission's official bulletin, but no interventions were filed. As set Fourth in the application, the company plans to offer all of the supported services required by the Act through resale of another carrier's services. Infinity has certified that it will and has continued to comply with the 911 requirements at the state and federal level, and the company has also provided staff with a copy of the FCC's approval of a compliance plan, and the company certifies that it's met the requirements for a conditional forbearance from the facility's requirement as evidenced by the FCC approval oh, compliance plan. Oh, Infinity is a provider of commercial mobile radio service and provides prepaid wireless telecommunication services by consumers by using the underlying wireless networks of AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile. Infinity has been designated as a lifeline-only wireless ETC in 11 states and is authorized by the FCC and the USAC to participate in the Affordable Connectivity Program throughout the United States, including in Louisiana. 
Pursuant to Section 214E of the Act, state commissions are given the authority to designate ETCs as common carriers, and consistent with that authority under federal law, the commission issued its ETC general order, which created a list of public interest criteria to be applied on a case-specific basis to all requests for ETC designation in areas served by rural tele telephone carriers. On March 6, 2024, staff filed its report and recommendation on the company's application, and wherein the staff found that the company had demonstrated consistent with the requirements of the Act, applicable FCC regulations, and the ETC general General order that it will make available to, it, to its customers universal service offerings that provide all services supported by the Federal Universal Service Fund. Staff also found that the designation of the company as an ETC is in the public interest. Staff recommends that the, co the Commission accept the staff report and recommendation filed into the record on March 6, 2024. Questions, Mr. Chairman? Is there a council or question or a, does someone representing this company here? I do not know if there's anyone representing the company here. Um, do you know who is representing them? Paul. Uh. Commissioner Paul Rochelle on behalf of commission staff. Mr. Lance Steinhardt is a representative of the company. He's supposed to be here today. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask that we move this till uh, April. Uh, I've not heard from them or by phone call or in person, and I'd like them to talk to me about it. Also, just as a housekeeping issue, for the future on the exhibit sheets under like the consultant, could you also start listing who represents the companies yeah. or rep represents the case? Sure. So we could just know in advance. So, but if it's okay, I'd like to just move this till April and get somebody from the company or representing the company or the company to contact the commissioners. I don't think they've talked to anybody. So. Yes, sir. All right. Okay, uh, Commissioner Scamata recommends moving exhibit four to next month. Is there any objection or discussion about that? Hearing none, we'll uh, so order to move it number four to next month. Exhibit five. Exhibit number five is docket number U36552. It's Claiborne Electric Cooperative's application for approval of a formula rate plan and modifications to base rates. It's a discussion and possible vote on an unopposed motion to amend commission order number U36552. On October 12th of 2022, Claiborne filed its application seeking approval of formula rate plan and modifications. And on February 19th of 2024, the commission issued its order number U36552, accepting the joint partial stipulation and accepting the final recommendation of the ALJ. Under order number U36552, Claiborne was authorized to implement the requested FRP with its first FRP annual report filing due March 1st of 2024. On March 1st, 2024, Claiborne filed an unopposed motion for extension of its rider deadlines and requested for expedited consideration, requesting that the deadlines for its first FRP annual report be extended by 30 days. And in the motion, Claiborne indicated that it's requested the extension because the timing of the issuance of order number U36552 did not allow Claiborne the full amount of time after a consultation, excuse me, after conclusion of the test year and the filing date requirement of March 1st to prepare an annual filing report. Staff recommends that the commission grant the motion and amend order number U36552 by extending the deadlines relative to Claiborne's first FRP annual filing. Uh, this is basically a housekeeping. Yes, sir. And uh, so I would make a, a motion that we accept staff recommendation. Second. Uh, staff uh, suggested by Commissioner Campbell and seconded by Commissioner Scametta. Is there any? Uh, Discussion or opposition? Hearing none, it's so, so ruled. Uh, number six. Exhibit number six is docket number U36658. This is Atmos Energy Corporation's application for renewal of a rate stabilization clause rider and a motion granted to consolidate dockets U35937 and U36658, keeping all in within docket number U36658. It's a discussion and possible vote to pursue it to Rule 57. And I believe all commissioners would like to defer this a month as well as uh, upset the procedural schedule that is in the docket at this moment. But uh, or, or pause it, yes. Yeah, so so there would, the, the deadlines currently on the books right now would no longer be on the books. Ms. what is the justification for suspending the procedural schedule? I think, or, or why are we? So my appreciation is the hearing is at the end of April, and there's op, there's pre-filing deadlines before you know pre-hearing statements and, and briefs do, and it's just to allow the parties to, I Prayer. guess, try to try to figure something out before then without having to, to worry about the, the briefing deadlines. Gotcha, well. gotcha. Thank you, and and I I, I I appreciate that, and I will support this. I, I'm just going to say for the record, 
this process on Exhibit 6 has extremely frustrated me. To attempt, in a way, to have us, as a company, vote on a tariff that was, has been edited since sun, was sent to me on Sunday night and has constantly seen edits, I think is not in the justice of transparency and for our ratepayers. So I am glad that we are moving towards the step of suspending and deferring Exhibit 6, but I am deeply, deeply frustrated and disappointed that we were even asked to do this by a company. Uh, I feel we have a procedural schedule. When there are contested matters, there is a process that we should use, and that is an ALJ hearing. And I did not like at all what I have seen and what I have witnessed. I have been up all night reading filings, testimony, because we have no ALJ hearing. We had no staff recommendation. And, and I just wanted to say this on the record, not only to Atmos, but to all companies. I do not appreciate that style of business. That leaves a very bad taste in my mouth about what you care and how you treat your ratepayers. Because this, to me, was an extreme disappointment to see and to play the games that I saw with I don't think was good face negotiation, which were scare tactics, which were delay tactics, and were bully tactics, I think, to our staff. I could not let not be on the record. The way Atmos treated our staff is unacceptable to me. And I believe you, do, you deserve to give our staff an apology for what you have put them through over these last two weeks. And I'm not going to stand for that. And I hope you do not try this ever again. And this is a warning from me to other utilities. Do not ever try to do this, because I think this is disrespectful to the commission, to the commission staff, but most importantly, disrespectful to the people of Louisiana, because there's no way I can make a good faith determination about their rates when we are editing and changing documents up until the very hour of a commission meeting. And so I, I just could not let this exhibit get off the agenda and not make those statements, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner Lewis. Uh, I, uh, I express the same feelings with, with a little less uh, frustration. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I'm a little bit older and maybe not any wiser than Lewis, but uh, this, is, this is customary in a lot of, uh, especially over in the legislature, but uh, well, I'll take a cheap shot at them. But uh, this is the Public Service Commissioner. There's five of us here. And uh, don't bring these uh, last hour deals to us because uh, it's not fair to our staff and uh, we've got to make decisions. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a CPA, I'm not an uh, electrical engineer, I am a fluids engineer, but there's not much fluid business here today. But, uh, but we take, it takes time, so we're going to move this over another 30 days. We've got to have a uh, approve a, some sort of a little document uh, uh, per timing schedule, is that right? Okay. Yeah, well, I think um, we'll, I'll staff and, and myself will work with Atmos to try to clean up some of the you know, the components that, that were last minute and, and given to us, and we'll try to have all of that resolved for the, the next agenda. Okay, well, I want to reemphasize, uh, Mr. Lewis and myself, uh, don't bring these things up here in the last hour. We're, gonna, we're not going to do it. Uh, we're not going to ask the staff to do it. So, uh, Commissioner Schmidt, uh, are we going to be able to... It, your mic. I'm sorry. Are we going to be able to... Uh, Delay the ALJ proceeding until uh, we. Yes, sir. You, you stepped out. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that was part uh, of yeah. it. Yeah. We, we, so that's we, part we, of this. Paused, yeah, yes. that's fine. As long as we pause the ALJ yes. and then we can correct whatever these issues are for April. Yes. That shouldn't be a problem then. So Thank we're you. asking to delay ALJ. Is there any uh, opposition to that statement or that procedure? Hearing none, we will. It will be delayed, okay. and we'll take this up uh, again next month. Is that right? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next exhibit, uh, what, number seven? Exhibit number seven is docket yeah, number U36661. This is Jefferson Davis Electric Cooperative's request for an exemption under the Commission's general order dated October 10th, 2013, the transmission siting order. It's a discussion and possible vote on staff's report and recommendation. On February 1st of 2023, JEDEC filed its request in accordance with the Commission's general order, and that request sought a determination that the construction of a 230 kV transmission loop to rebuild transmission facilities 
facilities lost and damage as a result of hurricanes Laura should be exempt from the certification requirements of the transmission siting order. Notice of this matter was published in the commission's official bulletin and timely requests for interventions were made by Cameron LNG in Entergy, Louisiana. Generally, the JDEC project consists of 100, 105 miles of overhead transmission line and then the project will tie into Entergy's 230 kV system at two separate points. The project also connects to JDEC's radial transmission lines and eight distribution substations, which will step down the transmission voltage to distribution voltage to serve JDEC's distribution system. The transmission siting order lays the groundwork for the commission to exercise its jurisdiction over the certification and siting of certain transmission facilities in Louisiana to achieve the regulatory goal of promoting safe, reliable utility service at the lowest reasonable rates. The transmission siting order allows the commission to grant exemptions for good cause shown and also enumerates several specific exemptions. Staff reviewed JDEX filing, the attachments thereto, responses to informal data requests, as well as an affidavit from Michael Pugh dated August 23, 2023, to determine if the project is exempt from the order. Additionally, Michael Heinen, the CEO of JDEX, and Michael Doris, JDEX FEMA liaison, testified at the commission's January 2023 B&E, providing details regarding the project. In the commission's order, the set in accordance with the Commission's order, staff filed its rep report and recommendation into the docket on March 8, 2024, wherein staff recommended that the JDEC project should be exempt from the transmission siting order for good cause shown due to extenuating circumstances surrounding the need for the project. Specifically, that JDEC's customers are currently being served through generator power. The construction of the JDEC project will be fully funded through a cost share mechanism between FEMA and the Louisiana State Office of Community Development. Staff also noted concerns regarding the potential sale of the transmission assets to another entity or the change in control of the assets in the future as well as potential rate impacts if the state and federal funding does not cover the entirety of the construction of the JDEC projects. As such, staff recommended the condition protecting the commission's jurisdiction over this issue, which would require JDEC to seek commission approval before any such sale change should commence, as a reservation of rights to look at ratepayer impacts in the next rate case. Both interveners had no opposition to staff's recommendation. Staff recommends that the commission accept staff's report and recommendation filed into the record on March 8, 2024. Uh, is there someone here representing uh, representing um, JDEC? JDEC. Uh, Ms. Ms. Yeah, so we got JDEC and uh, we got some royal engineer. We got the head guy with JDEC here, attorney. Uh, we got a couple of questions for you. Just setting out who you are. And yeah. Good morning. I have Mike Heinen, CEO of Jeff Davis. I also have Michael Pugh, owner of Royal Engineering. Royal Engineering at JDEC. Okay. And, uh, good morning. Uh, we are thankful. Uh, thank you guys for considering this. We are supportive of staff's report and recommendation, and uh, we're here to answer any questions you all might have. Okay. Uh, I think Commissioner Scamata has a question for you. I just uh, have a couple of questions. And it's really about sort of the long game on this. So um, this is being paid for by FEMA and the Louisiana Workforce Development? Uh, OCD? No, not Workforce okay. Development. Okay. So who's paying for it other than FEMA? Um, uh, the state receives um, community developed block grants. So it's through a seed. Uh, uh, CDB, CDB, yeah, CDB? The cost share program. Okay. So, the 10 so cost share is paid by what CDB. part of the state government pays that money to you? Is it DOR or? No, it goes through uh, Office of Community Development. <laughs> Office of Community Development. Okay. So, Maybe, um, my question is this not saying that any of this ever happens because sometimes it does happen when co ops get sold. Okay. So, um, I, I understand that co ops function as nonprofits. Right? Not for profit. Right? Not for profits. Right. Well, same thing in the Louisiana guys. But I don't look at it that way, okay? I look at it as being, in, there may not be investor owned utilities, but they're member owned utilities. But that's a personal way of looking at it. It's not a legal way of looking at it. But if you were to sell your co op to someone else and you got the money, you would divide that money amongst your members, correct? Or m amongst your meters, correct? like what we did with Valley Electric. Valley divided the money amongst its meters. If there was something uh, along those lines, I would assume we'd be as it was done in the past with other co-ops. Right, so you would th that money would not be going anywhere other than to the members uh, divided about in whatever proportions. So my question is this, 
if you're getting the money from the federal government and the state government through a federal grant, and you were to sell the co-op in the future, would you be returning the portion for the construction of this transmission line to FEMA and to the uh, Office of Community Development carved out as they paid for this, or would you be treating it as a gift to uh, JDAC and you would be delivering that money to the members if there was a, sell, a sale? I am not uh, an expert in how, how all of that works, but I will tell you this. Uh, we had a office that was destroyed during one of the hurricanes, uh, Rita and Laura, uh, not, not Laura, but uh, either Rita or Ike. We had that office uh, rebuilt in a different location instead of on the, on the coast of Cameron. And once that office was finished and we finished all the paperwork, that office now belongs to Jeff Davis Electric Co-op right. members. And if we should sell or the co-op should sell, that office would be a part of that and right. go to the membership. How much did that office cost? Oh, I, I'd be lying if I told well, you. Well, just rough guess. Millions. Okay. How much is this transmission line going to cost? Two hundred and, well. Total of roughly three hundred and seventy million. Three hundred seventy million. Yeah. How many members do y'all have in your co-op? Uh, roughly eleven thousand meters. Eleven thousand meters. Foster, you're a math teacher. What's three hundred and seventy million divided by eleven thousand? <laughs> what I'm saying is that that's taxpayer money. That's correct. And so my question is: is how the commission looks at should that money be returned to the federal government on such a magnitude spend, or sh are you? If is this going to be something that under commission rule that can be allocated to the co-op members? And that's my only concern about this. Right. Yes, sir? Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Go oh, ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I just want to ask a question. Yeah, okay. but that's, that's my only concern about this is when we go into these large FEMA, and this is about the transmission line, right? So this is, correct. this is something that's a little bit different than anything else, okay? This is about how we look at fundamentally uh, a question of uh, enrichment. It's a question of who is deserving of the ownership of this line. You know, I don't mind y'all using it, getting advantage of it and all this, but down the road, it's a question mark of is this something of taking from taxpayers to benefit a few versus getting the money back to put the money up for it. So that's, that's my only concern. Okay, so Commissioner that's Campbell? It. Commissioner Campbell? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> When what you call capital credits is what you're looking for. Uh, the co-ops have capital credits. That that's the money owned to the owed to the membership. Correct. Well, what happened in Valley Electric when uh, Swepco bought it? They had to give the capital credits back to the people. So they found out who were there since the 20s, and they did their best to give it back. Uh, if the government helped you build back your system by 300 something million, uh, the government doesn't own the co-op, they own the co-op. So it might look a little bit unfair, but the government's bailed out a lot of people and they don't always pay them back. Yeah. Uh, and what would happen if you sold this co-op, whoever bought the co-op, the capital credits wouldn't go with it. You'd have to pay them off, the people who own the co-op. So. The government came in in a disaster and rebuilt this, which they had to, because the people couldn't afford it. So uh, that's that's what would happen. You sold it. I don't. It's not for sale. No. No. And no, if, thank you. if it is for sale, the membership would have to vote on it to sell it, wouldn't it, Brandon? Yes. That's yes. what we. You know. So it's a big ordeal. Yes, sir. The membership would have to vote to sell it. And you'd have to find somebody to buy it, but they'd sell everything they had. They made the co-op run, but the capital credits would not go. The, the, the money for the capital credits goes to the membership. It belongs to the membership, mm -hmm. right? The whole cooperative, in, in essence, belongs to the membership. We had millions of dollars. I don't know how much it was. That Swepco. Um, when they bought Valley, we had millions of dollars that went back to the people. And then we searched and searched and searched, and then finally we couldn't find any more people. 
So they had a big pile of money left and they gave it to Northwestern because Northwestern was right in the middle of their area and it was a college that helped a lot of people. So nobody got to keep it and went to Northwestern and under, they gave scholarships for people who were members of Valley Rural Electric, their children. So like a lot of like a lot of government programs, <clears throat> the government comes in at time of disaster. They help us out, and uh, they don't own the co-op. The people own the co-op. That's correct. And and for everyone's benefit, what what Commissioner Campbell's talking about that was actually Zimmering's uh, brainchild, working with Commissioner Campbell to come up with the method to do that. So yep. just yep. another one of Paul's legacies. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware. You know, my concerns are. It's pretty simple. Like if an investor-owned utility has, a, like, because the, replacing this transmission line for JDAC is because of the storm, right? That's correct. Right. So if we're replacing transmission lines for an investor-owned utility, that comes out of storm costs that our ratepayers are paying, right? The federal government's not paying that. So, you know, that's a whole different story, right? You know, so we're doing a different thing for investor-owned utilities than we're doing for member-owned utilities. Because Foster, Commissioner Campbell just stated it, that the members own your co-op, right? Correct. And it is not a not-for-profit corporation, okay? Because not-for-profit corporations aren't owned by anybody. In fact, under Louisiana law, when they are sold, they have successor uh, non-profit, not-for-profits that are designated in their articles of incorporation that get all the money. So you, when you form them, you nominate a, a successor nonprofit. Many of them name the American Cancer Society, the American Red Cross, someone like that, or a university to take all the money. Okay? So this concept that, you know, co-ops are not-for-profit, it, it doesn't jibe with me because the money does get divided up amongst the members, which I'm fine with if we treat everybody the same. But my concerns about this are we definitely were creating two different classes of ratepayers between the members of co-op and the, and the customers of an investor-owned utility because they're getting treated differently by the federal government and I don't like the idea of we're treating them differently from the state government on how we look at uh, this this element of money coming from the federal government de being potentially divided uh, amongst the uh, you know the cooperatives and especially when we're getting into transmission lines and what if uh, you've got the federal government to build you a power plant for a billion dollars you know it starts getting to a question mark of fundamental fairness and equality amongst how we treat all the ratepayers in the state so I just wanted to bring this up more of a topic of discussion I know you're going to build it I'm supportive of you building it but I do think that this is a, it's, it's a question of, of equity that we need to look at on how we're going to treat the people who are actually funding these things and how we're going to look at the ultimate resolution of these things when they do. Because eventually, sometimes co-ops do get sold. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they are. But it's a question of you know, how the, the, you know, the taxpayers, how the ratepayers all get treated in the end. So I wanted to bring that up more for you know, thought process than anything else. But, I'll go ahead and make a motion to accept the staff recommendation on this. Okay, I've got a, uh, Commissioner Lewis got a question. No, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Green has a question. I have a question. Uh, Mr. Pugh, so what's important to me is are three things, resiliency, transparency, and accountability. So what is the win rating of the current, the new build compared to the old? Well, the new build is uh, the design standard, um, which FEMA would pay for, is what's called a stormer record. Um, and if the stormer record exceeds current code, you can design a higher standard. In this case, Laurel is the stormer record, so the, the system that's getting built right now is designed to a 160 mile an hour wind rating, which is higher than current code. And it's my understanding if, if it fails under that wind rating, that FEMA will then repair it uh, on, their, on their dime, is that that's right? Correct. Correct. And then. Are y'all overseeing the, you know, the transparency and accountability? Can you attest to that it's being done properly and uh, right. on so budget? Part of the grant process is, and just to put it in simplistic terms, is you know, we have to document ad nauseum the FEMA of this is what the system looked like before, this is what it looked like immediately after the storm, and this is what it looks like now, how much it costs, 
from a from a specific to every GPS location of each pole and how it's affecting the turtles and the water and the snails. So um, if you want transparency and documentation, I can bury you in it. Okay. <laughs> um, and it's part of the grant process, right? It's, sure. This is what we do for well, the kind of, I kind of like to hear that because I want to know that what's being built is what was needed to be built and not more and for the price that was said was to be built. Yeah. And this is mainly an example of what we're going to do for the rest of the state. Like how, how is this going? and what lessons can be learned. We so. have to go through a pretty rigorous, what's called a cost reasonableness analysis with FEMA. Um, and it's um, it's all goes back to what's reasonable, what's not reasonable. And so it's quite a process, but yeah, from a transparency and documentation, um, this is what we do, but yeah, it's pretty significant. And then y'all, I mean, with Jeff Davis, the, the commission, yeah. we can come and present all this. We have oh, no, no, I'm just asking, because um, in a rebuild it better than, you, than it was before mindset, uh, it sounds like this is going to be better, paid for by the federal government, and they're on the hook if it if it doesn't meet what they say it's going to meet. Well, and then part of it is you, you have an engineer that designs a set of plans to build something. You got a price to build it. You got a government who's paying for it. There's also a, a second layer of accountability, which happens in the field is is what's on paper being put in the field properly. Right. So we document that as well okay. too in real time. Would you say it's go going as expected, better than expected? Is the timeline? Are we keeping up on the timeline? Uh, yeah, we're, okay. it's it's going as expected. Okay. Well, thank y'all. This this matters a lot to me because um, I, I choose a word every year to to work on for myself, and my word for this year is anti-fragile. And there's not there's not a word in the English language that is opposite of fragile. And I think that our grid um, has been fragile or has been um, subject to more than it could withstand. And so I'm looking at how can, do I want my impact on the commission to be 30 years from now is that, well, we left it better than we found it, meaning uh, less fragile. If so I'm it certainly I'm seems like. very excited about this program. I think it's going to be a, um, a, um, a state of the art and a, a, an example of what uh, government and uh, communities getting together can do. If you excited. get a wild hair to sell it, will you just give us a heads up? <laughs> Thanks. No wild hairs today, as you can see. <laughs> well, listen, uh, as chairman, we don't didn't get you up here for some gotcha questions, and uh, but there's been some important questions brought up. Uh, I'm thinking uh, to. Uh, treat you guys right. We need to write down these questions. They come back next month and answer these questions. So I want to ask the, uh, all the commissioners to uh, let's write these questions down, turn them over to our staff. I'll get them over to uh, Jeff Davis so that you can, because they are legitimate. I, I, I have the same, some of the same questions that uh, the Commissioner Schmidt has about it. This, this, this uh, 230 line is in my district. I'm really proud of it, but, uh, and there are. And you know, we've got a lot of movement with the co-ops now, you know, buying your own power. Things are changing, man, in the electricity business. So uh, whereas uh, basically no co-op had transmission lines before, now you're having them. And uh, it's a really changing world. And uh, so I promised when you come up here next time, uh, the only questions I'll expect you to answer with, with authority is the ones we write down and uh, to come help us uh, in the future. Sure. And uh, so just to clear, make sure everybody understands all the things we're talking about, there's a new 230 KV line being being constructed in Cameron, Louisiana at almost $400 million. It's going to be the state of the art. Uh, hurricanes are not going to be able to blow them down. You said if they do, the FEMA's going to come back and give us some money to put them back up. Is that true? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So that, that's good. And uh, I just uh, also in my area, is, is Vermillion Parish and your, your uh, brother co-op Slimco. And uh, they barely got enough uh, electricity in Pecan Island to keep the lights on, you know. And so uh, I would just uh, challenge the other co-ops and, uh, and ask everyone, why don't we have a 230 line all along the coast, uh, not just in Cameron? So, uh, and I know that's not a question for you to answer, but I just want to throw that challenge out to the, to the rest of the co-op. So. Any other questions or comments? Okay, we'll get you some questions. Uh, be prepared Sounds to good. come back next month and give so. Uh,
commissioners come out and make the motion and, uh, and I'll second that motion. Uh, any other discussions? So uh, exhibit seven is passed, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Exhibit number eight is docket number U36809. This is Concordia Electric Cooperative's formula rate plan annual report for the 2022 test year. Is a discussion and possible vote on a unopposed motion. On October 13th of 2023, the commission issued order number U36809, accepting Concordia's 2022 annual report. One of the conditions established by that order required Concordia to file a full base rate review no later than June 1st of 2024. The firm formerly used by Concordia for rate reviews is no longer in operation. Therefore, Concordia had to retain another firm, but they cannot complete the rate review prior to June 1st. As such, Concordia requested an additional four months in order to complete the full base rate review via its unopposed motion filed March 6, 2024. As stated, the motion staff is unopposed to the grant of additional time. The extension would not result in any rate impact as Concordia would simply continue charging okay. its current rates for an additional four months. Staff okay. recommends that the commission You're grant okay. Concordia's motion for filed March 6, 2024 and amend order number U36809 to allow Concordia additional four months to file its full base rate review. Uh, motion staff, staff Second. Commissioner Campbell, the next motion we accept staff Staff recommendation and second by Commissioner Scametta. Any other discussion or objection? Hearing none, uh, number eight pass. Number nine. Exhibit number nine is a docket to be determined as Energy Services potential request for proposals for existing energy and capacity resources is a discussion and possible vote to retain an outside consultant. On February 6, 2024, Energy Services submitted a notice letter to the commission regarding an anticipated upcoming RFP. Staff issued an NRFP seeking an outside consultant and received one conforming bid in response. That bid was from Jay Kennedy and Associates of $90,000 in fees and $1,500 in expenses for a total budget not to exceed of $91,500. Staff makes no recommendation as the sole conforming bidder was qualified. Yeah, there were other people that was defective. Motion to accept that recommendation. Second. Uh, I've got some discussion on that. Uh, well, that's what I, I wanted to uh, thank you, Commissioner Campbell. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask our commissioners to reconsider that motion and uh, and give them another month to try to find some other bidders. Uh, I think Commissioner Campbell is in the same way, but we got two other commissioners jumped in here. So uh, I would like to respectfully uh, call up uh, the in uh, motion. And uh, well, actually, we could have a. a I, 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 if that's well, I'm more than happy to. If that's the will of the body, I'm more than happy to remove my motion if that's if we want to put it out for another another month. Okay, we kind of so. unwound this thing back to uh, <laughs> all right, and we got uh, Larry Hand with Entergy here. Uh, give us your uh, thoughts on this. Situation, Good morning, commissioners. Uh, I did want to certainly understand when you have a only one qualified bidder, you, you only have one choice. I get that. I do want to you know, let you all know this RFP is to solicit existing capacity resources. Uh, the state of Louisiana, MISO South, you've heard it before, I think you'll hear it again. We are looking at um, a fairly exigent, dire capacity situation. We have a, a finite amount of existing capacity. As generation ages or it's shut down because of environmental reasons, the capacity available will go down. We have load growing at the same time. We have a lot of solar um, in the interconnection queue that will be developed, but a solar resource, 50 megawatts, is not equal to a dispatchable resource of 50 megawatts. Um, and so this, this RFP here was intended to solicit um, existing capacity resources, what's out there, what's available. And I will tell you, um, you know, this, the processes we follow at this commission, whether it's the market-based mechanism order or the certification requirements, adds two years to the procurement process for existing resources or new resources. Um, and that places Louisiana and our customers, your constituents, at a disadvantage to procuring available resources. So states like Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, they are looking at the same time as us at existing capacity resources, trying to procure it. And if, if we delay this um, to, to, to maybe get another bid, whatever, uh, we're putting our customers, your constituents, at a significant disadvantage 
to, uh, for the opportunity to acquire existing capacity. Um, the alternative to existing capacity is new build capacity, which uh, with inflation, with demand for combustion, <coughs> building, you know, the cost of new build is going up and up and up. And so I, I just want to make that known I that a question. delay here will harm, I think, harm our opportunities to acquire existing capacity. Uh, there's, there's a lot, as you know, uh, Clico Cajun is in the process of divesting the, the wholesale assets to a, to a third party. Um, that third party will want to monetize those assets, sell them. And if we're off on the sideline waiting for a hire, waiting for an MBMO process, we're, we're putting our customers and your constituents at great risk. I just wanted to make that known. I respect the, the need to want to get more uh, bids for the hiring, but time is of the essence. So is 30 days going to drive you crazy? You know, I, I would, I would, it won't drive me crazy. I'm used to, I'm used to the process, but I will say we're well, it already. Drive me crazy. Well, I, I, we're already 30, 60 30 days. Thirty days can't, can't shut the world down. Well, it, and I say it won't because we're already sixty days late. Well, and and just to to put on record and clarify, we we received three bids. Two of the bids did not conform to the requirements of the RFP. Only one did. So we did receive three bids. Just two of them didn't didn't follow the RFP. Um, if I don't know if that changes anyone's no, mind. When that happens, do you call them up and say, "Hey, you"? I, I did. I notified them that so it you did even not. You asked them to. Yes, and why it did bid. not conform. Yes. So uh, there's just a limited number of service providers out there to help us uh, with these decisions. Uh, there is. And I'm, I'm with uh, Commissioner Campbell on a 30 days ain't gonna kill us, but uh, at the same time, and I'm from the real business world and. Uh, Looks like uh, we got another speaker wants to come up, and, and uh, Philip May, the energy. He will, he'll probably say what I said with more uh, <laughs> persuasion. I'll, also, too, I, I want to add to what Catherine said, and I was because I was wondering why I had three in my thing. The other two bids were higher, the ones that were non-conforming. So it's not like they were lower bids. Just so we'd be the, taking a little bit, okay? And or, or a, I say higher. One was about the ex, yeah. almost exactly the same as the Jay Kennedy. One was okay. uh, higher. Is this the president of Intergy, Louisiana? I'm Philip, Philip May, May, president okay. of Intergy, Louisiana. Okay. Uh, commissioners, I appreciate the concern. I do want to highlight the challenge we have is we have other companies and states competing for capacity that's currently in the marketplace. Arkansas, Mississippi, Texas. Those states have processes that move faster than the state of Louisiana's processes. Why is that? Because they don't take as long to make a decision on things like capacity. The market-based mechanism is not required, for instance, in Texas or in Arkansas. And so the net of that is, while it's not the 30-day extension, which seems reasonable, that will harm our ability to acquire that capacity, it's the net of we have a process that's slower, we have an extension for 30 days, and then it's the risk of a missed opportunity that provides lower cost resources for our customers as opposed to the alternative, which we know is gonna be higher cost. You don't, you don't think you're gonna be able to get it any cheaper than this? This bid here of 91,000? I, I am completely uh, agnostic to the bids my only concern is I know that I have, when I start the race, my opponents will be ahead of us because of the process. So an extra 30 days, it's not the 30 days, it's that we already have a race in which our opponents are ahead of us because of the process. <clears throat> your opponents are, are your fellow company. That, that Could be. Well, <laughs> that's pretty rough, isn't it? I mean, you don't have any leeway with a, uh, a sister company. Uh, are, are they that cutthroat? I mean, if they know you're in a bind, I mean, Arkansas and Mississippi, uh, they will, they will follow the processes and the requirements that their commission set, as will we. And if their process, if I'm a seller of capacity and I get to pick, where do I go? Do I want to wait through a longer process, or do I want to go through a short process that provides me certainty and clarity about when I may get paid for that? set of assets. And again, I have no position on the bids. It's just simply the reality of the fact that 
we have a limited opportunity, a limited window to go after these assets. We know other utilities are looking at these assets and it's, it's not the 30 day delay in of itself, it's the fact that we already are late entering the race. And that's our fault? Well, it's, uh, it's not your fault, it's just the simple reality that the process here designed by this commission takes longer than in some of yeah. the other commissions. Mr. Campbell, I, I, after hearing what they said, I believe we got the low bid, three bids, they're just uh, in, a, in a kind of a different kind of way, but uh, I'm, I'm I'm at peace with that now. I've Just heard that. Quick question, uh, Commissioner Kamata. Commissioner Gray. Uh, if we waited a month, would those other two bids then come into conformity? If they would like to. I mean, they, they have the option to. Okay, but we know that they're slightly higher than the current bid and non conforming. Correct. Okay. I agree with you. And Commissioner, I would, I would note that those other two bids now know. Yeah, well, okay. Okay. also fair. <laughs> well, we'll get a lower price next time. Well, they won't rebid. No. So my, my, uh, uh, the only reason I'm saying is that we've got a habit leave them all of on. getting one bid, one it's bid, one bid. This is a lot of money, and that's a terrible habit to be in. You know, when you're trying to buy something, you always want to have two or three people. Uh, and we tried to do that. So. Uh, my, my question is for staff, which is um, on these bids, the, uh, other than the amount they bid, mm -hmm. can the staff tell them that they can act with remedial action to correct their bid and become compliant for the purposes of the bid? Can they correct their bid without changing their bid amount? Through, because I remember we, and without revealing, we discussed what one of the bid's failures were. Correct. Can they correct? these type of changes and still be viable? So the, the way the RFP is written, it says if you do not conform, it will be rejected. However, if the commission wants to allow these two to come back in and correct their actions, th you can. You, okay, you, well, that's your... well my, my suggestion for the commission to think about, maybe if not for this, but for the future, is that as long as the terms of the RFP do not change the total amount of the bid. Mm -hmm. Any uh, technical component of the bid that may disqualify the bid can be subject to a, a, a subsequent remedial action that can be allowed for correction of the bid if it's effectively uh, just a, uh, a failure to put some component clause or whatever that's necessary to meet the technical specifications of the RFP. But they can't change the dollar amount to come into compliance. And I think that's something to be considered on the staff end so we can clear up bids that may, some person may leave out a, a unit like we talked about or other issues. But as long as they don't change the dollar amount to leave us into a position to make considerations. Because this commission has not always picked a low bid. Correct. And so that sort of is uh, an irrelevant I mean, while it's nice to talk about the potential of this being the lowest, that doesn't mean we would have always picked it. So, but I do think that the way you strike, uh, write the RFPs, as long as we're not changing that and we're taking some corrective action on minutia and that they can correct that and get it done within X days, mm -hmm. then that helps us put people back in the game for consideration. Will do. Okay. So. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. May and Mr. Hand, I want to thank you for your comments and, and I guess my question for you are, and we've had these conversations before about um, as we enter this kind of energy revolution that we probably need to be looking at how the commission modern, modernize itself in uh, a more competitive way. I mean, I think, I, I think what you talked about, uh, Mr. May, is, is exactly something that I've been deeply concerned about, which is as we are progressing, everyone around us is also uh, changing and that it, it requires, I think, some regulatory uh, reforms uh, to our processes, to uh, how we conduct uh, business to ensure that we are not left behind in this moment. So I wanted to go on the record and thank you for your comment. That has been something that has been a concern of mine that I am thinking about as a commission, how we do that uh, collectively, not only uh, from, from, from the outside, but from, from internally. And I think on, um, this has been a concern of mine. I, I, I'm going to work with staff about how we also find a way to diversify 
our qualified consultant list. I think that is becoming a, a challenge for us. I think not anything of the commission's fault, but as uh, companies are requiring or asking for more, as we as commissioners are considering the different technologies, the different um, innovations, the different ways to assess and regulate uh, utilities, I think this is a moment for us all to say, how do we do better and how do we conform uh, to the new existing ecosystem uh, that may jeopardize us and at the end of the day could end up in higher rates, right? I mean, I think that is also the challenge uh, that we're working on. If we end up in a place where we cannot procure capacity uh, or cheaper capacity in such a timely manner, we may be left with um, less affordable options uh, than we, we could have had. And so um, I, I look forward to working with you and I appreciate uh, your, your comments today. And if there's anything, uh, I see Ms. Chan, that you, you want to add on that point. Yeah, I mean, thank you for the remarks. Um, and, and I don't mean to suggest that this you know, 30 day extension, whatever is, is, is going to change the world. We are going to always follow the commission's orders, the commission's processes, but I, I will, you know, rest assured, you know, Commissioner Campbell, you mentioned it's kind of cutthroat. We have, uh, potentially affiliates of ours that Philip and I do not work for. Um, they have a body just like you to answer to. And so they're trying to do what's best for their customers. And I rest assured, we're going to follow your rules, but we're also going to do it in a way that we think gives us a chance to compete uh, timely for those resources. Uh, and we'll, if, if we do, if we're lucky enough to procure any, we'll come back to you and get approval. Um, but rest assured, we're going to follow your rules, but we're also going to do everything within our power to compete for the resources to bring, you know, that value to our customers. Commissioner Schumata. Uh, I got a quick question for Entergy. Uh, and we're talking about available components of what's available out there from, I guess, you would consider this to be merchant power? This, is lim this RFP is limited to existing resources that are in service today that are available on available the Available resources, yes. not in So, Correct. But I, I want to just ask you, because we've had discussions, and I don't know if, tell me if you're not at liberty to discuss this, but we're looking at future resources that are going to be needed in Louisiana, that are going to go beyond this, like, small construct 50 megawatts and things like this. And so we're, we're going to have to, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but we're going to have to build new power plants beyond solar. We're going to have to build new gas plants. I mean, we're looking at the future of nuclear, but realistically, that's something that's a four or five year project. But we're going to have to look at building some new gas plants in this state. I mean, what are your thoughts on how soon we're going to have to get involved in that? So our, our integrated resource plan, which is, um, was, accepted by the commission. It's not approved in the sense of you approved resources, but that did outline with unity of active deactivations, low growth, there will be a need for additional new build capacity. Uh, existing capacity is great because it gives you capacity at a lower cost than a new build, but to serve, you know, incremental load and load pockets, new build resources will be required. Um, our thought process behind trying to test the market to see before we go commit to new builds for load pockets, let's see what's in the market. Let's see what we can get in the market that's available today. Lock that up and then identify what are the additional new build resources we need to add on top of that. Right. Well, I think you would agree that the, the problem of eventually at some point in the marketplace, somebody's got to build something to serve the marketplace because everybody wants to dive into the market, but eventually somebody's got to build a power plant. And we know that, you know, in Louisiana, the people who are going to build power plants more than likely are either Swepco, Clico, or Entergy for the, for the purposes of this issue. And so, you know, my question is, you know, I, I've seen the projections from the Department of Economic Development. I've seen the projections from some of the utilities. And it looks like we're going to need at least one or at least 1,000 megawatts of, of new, new power. A base load power at a minimum and sort of when do you think that sort of date of, of when do you think we're going to need that by what year it, it, it would be difficult to say precisely I will tell you that uh, I've been in this industry for 39 years uh, or will be in another month or two we have never seen a, an economic development pipeline what we're seeing right now uh, back when the 50s and 60s when the state was growing its chemical and refinery industry, this is 
much bigger than that. But it's gonna require that we act with speed and we have to make sure that we know this load is coming before we go back and start building a new plant. Yes, we will need spinning generation, which currently is, is natural gas fired, but that gas fired plants will have to have with an accommodation for clean energy because a prerequisite for the industries that are coming is going to be sustainability. So they, we have to have decarbonization associated with that new power plant as well because it's not a policy that's driving this, it is the customer's customers that is driving that. So the things we need to succeed to attract that load, and I think we'll talk a bit more about this in a moment, is uh, a reliable, a resilient, and a sustainable grid. If we do those three things, we will have one of the greatest economic opportunities this state has ever seen. Well, imagine that the capacity for the clean energy component of it exists. What, do you, what are you thinking that the state's gonna need in megawatts of new generation of baseload power is going to be just and sort of by when so it, and it I'm depends, not going to hold you to it yeah so it depends on when this stuff shows up because uh, you know according to the LSU Center for Energy Studies and I'm sure you've seen that there's right. 130 million billion dollars of announcements that have been made right um, this is something that we've seen the pace of this pick up most of that is in what I call energy manufacturing, but it also includes transition, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, ammonia, that type of thing, renewable diesel, um, but not including the solar manufacturer plan. So the timing of that is very important, and we're working with these potential customers to know precisely when that shows up. But we are arriving at the date very quickly where we, have to, we will have to ask this commission for, for permission to do an RFP for a new generation. Um, I'm not sure if that's within the next two quarters or the next year, but that date is coming soon. Do you think it's reasonable to think that the state's going to need uh, 1,000 megawatts or we're going to need 2,000 megawatts or we're going to need 3,000 megawatts? I mean, what, what sort of bandwidth of total energy requirements do you think we'll need over, let's say, the next five years? And, and Commissioner, I'd like to address it from, before I answer your direct question, um, if you take the load growth off the table, which is very real, mm -hmm. but the unit deactivations, you know, we have, for example, nine mile four, nine mile five, uh, very large units, 700 plus megawatts each. So there's 1,500 megawatts just at that station alone that is um, almost as old as I am. So, you know, it's, it's not gonna be there forever. <laughs> it, it's gonna, those units will deactivate uh, or the amount of investment required to keep them in service becomes astronomical. So there's probably 3,000 megawatts of older legacy gas units that will need to deactivate over the next five to six years. You know? That does not include new build. Correct, I mean, so that's right. just existing capacity that's in a load pocket. If you think about that, you need to replace that in the load pocket. And then when you add on, you layer on load growth we're talking about, some of these you know, single projects can be 500 megawatts, 1,000 megawatts, very large load. So the 3,000 could quickly become, depending on when they want to sign and commit, it could become 6,000. Right, so do you, let's, on that, and my last question, because I know we want to get out of here and we're almost done. If we're going to go to a potential term of over, say, several years to 6,000 megawatts, do you think it's a reasonable action over that six-year term to begin a process to, say, replace half of that with new nuclear? Absolutely. Um, that has to be part of the equation because, you know, baseload power, carbon-free power is, is, is the unicorn in the resource planning game. It's my understanding that most of the uh, economy that wants build, whether it's steel or something, okay. is looking for uh, all products to be performed on what they're referring to as clean energy, and that needs baseload clean of nuclear. So, but between nuclear and natural gas as a combination, we can achieve net zero on that future sort of model, is my understanding. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the gas, obviously, it, you know, we're, we're trying to solve that part of the equation, how do you capture and, and safely store it, effectively store it, you know, we're trying to solve that part, but uh, SMRs, new nuclear, um, 
the technology is developing. It's it's expensive, but it is a known technology that can. There's no question about the carbon there. There is no carbon. There are other issues, safety issues, okay. cost. But that, if it were available today and economic, um, I think we'd have an application before you to pursue that. Well, okay, okay Commissioner. Uh, thousands are available. Commissioner Lewis for, for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in, in lieu of the conversation, I would move uh, that we accept uh, what I'm lost. Low bid. The bid. <laughs> the bid. <laughs> <laughs> I'd accept the, 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 the uh, bid on Exhibit 9. I'll second that low bid. Uh, is there any other discussion about it? Any objection to that? <laughs> Hearing none, uh, we're, we will accept that Thank bid. Uh, Thank move you. forward. Thank you. Uh, we're on number 10. Exhibit number 10 is our reports resolutions. We have already taken care of, thank you. We've already taken care of the resolution for Z. We do have a discussion and possible vote to ratify votes taken by Chairman Francis acting as the commission's representative on the regional state committee of the Southwest Power Pool. This was exhibit 11 last month. Staff followed the protocol set forth in Special Order 17 2019 to consult with the Executive Secretary and the Vice Chairman and to make a recommendation to Chairman Francis prior to the votes. The protocols also require that the votes taken be ratified at a following B and E. There were seven voting items before the RSC. Uh, last month, and in the first is a the first was a vote approved several changes to improve transmission congestion congestion hedging on the SPP system. The second vote approved a proposal to allow SPP to nominate certain long term congestion rights. The third vote approved a backstop policy to provide regional funding for certain transmission sure. projects. The fourth vote approved tariff language to be included in a FERC filing to provide further information on how SPP uses loss of load expectation studies. The fifth vote approved prioritizing outage policies critical for the winter planning reserve margin. The sixth vote approved several measures to ensure resource availability. And the seventh vote approved the 2022 regional cost allocation review lessons learned report. Based on staff's recommendation, Chairman Francis voted in favor of all of these voting items. Staff Ooh. recommends that the commission ratify Chairman Francis's votes taken on February 5th, 2024 as the Public Service Commission's representative to the SPP RSC. Move to accept, uh, move to ratify the votes of Chairman Francis on all issues stated. No, I'll abstain from the vote. I'll second. Oh, uh, all right. Is there any objection to the approving okay. the votes? Uh, we no, also, I'm oh, sorry. And I'll All clear. Up. Okay. Yep. We also have a discussion and possible vote to ratify interventions of the commission in RTO related and other FERC proceedings. And do the short deadlines allow for these interventions? If command, advanced commission approval is not possible, the executive secretary on the recommendation of UPC or Stone Pigman or on his own determination may authorize the initial interventions, comments, or protests subject to ratification. Staff recommends that the commission ratify the following interventions. Intervention in docket ER24-1158. Intervention in docket ER24-1332. Intervention in docket ER24-1381. And intervention in a, in a appeal uh, at the DC circuit with num uh, docket numbers 24-1032 and 24-1033. Move to approve the interventions as stated by council. Second. We have a Motion and second by Mr. Uh, Lewis. Any uh, objections or discussion? Hearing none, approved. Exhibit number 11 is docket number R35462. This is the commission's rulemaking to research and evaluate customer-centered options for all electric customer classes as well as other regulatory environments. It's an update from staff on phase one and two reports at the request of Commissioner Green and Ms. Evans was going to give that report. Good morning, Commissioners. Lauren Evans on behalf of staff. Um, staff filed its report in this docket on March 15th, seeking feedback and comments on the proposed rules um, and requesting that that feedback be filed into the docket by April 15th, 2024. Um, so that's kind of the update on where we are in that rulemaking. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, um, Mr. Bowen, I want my name on that also is requesting that report. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, staff, for everything. Uh, it's been open for almost four or five years now, so I just wanted to kind of get a monthly update on where things are and where we're going. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
Do we have anybody to give an update now? Or you uh, she did. She just did. did. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, God. Sorry well, about that. All right. So yeah, my brain was on the other way, but okay. Yeah. To exhibit number 12. All right. It's docket number U36625. This is Intergy's application for approval of the Intergy Future Ready Resilience Plan Phase 1. And this is an update from Intergy Louisiana at the request of Chairman Francis. And I'm assuming Mr. Hand will be the one who is uh, going to give that update. Put yeah, down, down your coke and get back up here. <laughs> yep, come on. <laughs> Good morning again, Commissioners. Larry Hand on behalf of Intergy Louisiana. I'm joined again by Philip May. Um, appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to give a quick update. Um, Mr. May alluded to some of this earlier, so I'll keep it pretty brief. Um, you know, as, as we all know, uh, we've all lived through 2020 and 2021 the devastating hurricane seasons that we had here in Louisiana, first affecting with Laura Delta and in the Lake Charles area and then Zeta kind of southeast Louisiana. And then the next year, um, you know, with Hurricane Ida, very significant impacts to the Louisiana citizenry and our customers um, and very significant cost impacts, which we are very cognizant of. Um, you know, to restore the system as quickly as possible, we brought in crews from all across the country uh, we, we spared, you know, no effort to, to bring people in to get it, get the lights on as quickly as possible. Uh, with the amount of damage we had, we had to replace between those two seasons about 46,000 poles uh, across across the state, um, and that, that's a very large number of poles to replace in a you know two or three week period. But we brought in the resources to get it done. Um, to do that, of course, you got to feed them, you got to house them. Uh, all the sorts of things, uh, and it, it adds to the cost. When you replace a pole during a storm event, after a storm event, it costs two to three times what it would, what it would cost if I sent a crew out today to go replace a pole. Um, and so people always ask, you know, why don't we, why don't we do that more proactively, more thoughtfully? And you know, following, uh, I guess, when the restoration for Hurricane Ida was still underway, we began to undertake that planning effort. Uh, we retained a consulting firm with experience uh, in Florida to kind of leverage the, the learnings, the knowledge, and the experiences from Florida, uh, what they have done over the last 20 years to harden their system. Uh, we retained a firm to kind of advise us to look at the, the current state of our system, our distribution assets primarily, but also transmission, look at the current state of our system and assess it, uh, its vulnerability to future storms. And they have a storm model that looked at a 50-year future period and kind of predicting the range of storms that could occur and identified what are the what are the weakest links in that system and what can we do to invest in it pro uh, proactively thoughtfully to harden it to minimize the the outages and the the restoration times and future events um, just as an example um, you know Florida Power and Light um, and all, uh, other Florida utilities had very significant impacts in 2022 from Hurricane Ian um, their system, you know, after 20 years, very hardened, but they still had outages. But the, the restoration time was remarkable because instead of replacing poles, they were picking up a conductor that blew off or an insulator that broke and putting it back on the pole that was still standing. So it, it may take us a day to replace a pole. When you have to just put a wire back on, a conductor back on it, it's very quick. So we, we leveraged those lessons. Uh, we, we, we came up with a plan. Um, and we, you know, during that time, I think in 2019, before those storms, and in 2021, this commission opened a few rulemaking dockets to consider policy matters relating to uh, grid maintenance, pole viability, uh, resilience, you know, all those sorts of things that um, those dockets have continued to progress. There's been a lot of comments, feedback from the commission staff, from uh, stakeholders. We've looked at what we've heard. None of those dockets are done yet. But we've we've kind of leveraged the the knowledge in those dockets and the feedback we've gotten. Um, we did file in 2022, uh, so December of 2022, we did file a uh, a hardening proposal, resilience proposal, requesting a, a five-year plan uh, that's been pending. Um, but during the course of that, the feedback we've gotten from key stakeholders, in commissioners and others, was that um, we we want to be thoughtful about this. We want to we need to, as a state, we need to become more resilient and kind of more hardening investment. 
And so we've, we've through that process, we've kind of pivoted to, let's look at the, the no regrets type of hardening approach, not a 10 year plan, not the full five year plan we requested, but what's the no regrets approach we can take as a state to start addressing the, the lowest hanging fruit to, to get the benefit? Uh, just as an example, you know, we, we put forward to the parties a proposal uh, of a reduced, more focused and refined proposal for hardening. Uh, when we originally filed the, the application in December 2022, you know, we had, um, it might have been, I think the request was a set of improvements that amounted to about, estimated to cost about $5 billion, rounding a little bit. Um, with the feedback we've gotten, we said, well, let's, let's look at the stuff we can start on no regrets. I'm, I'm, we, we made a proposal to the parties about what that subset of projects could be like. Um, and I don't want to comment too much on what we've put to the parties because it's a settlement negotiation. Uh, but we sent that over a week and a half ago or so. Um, but just for context, um, the original proposal we filed back in December 2022 had a, a benefit to cost ratio, so every dollar of hardening that we spent, we expected in that portfolio to get about a uh, benefit to cost ratio of 4.5. So every, every dollar you spend on the asset, you're expected to get $4.5 of benefit, whether it's reduced restoration costs or reduced outage times uh, following major storms. The, the refined proposal we have targeted uh, that the parties are looking at uh, has a benefit to cost ratio of about nine. So for every dollar of hardening investment we spend in this revised proposal, would, would expect to yield benefits to customers in terms of reduced restoration costs or reduced outages following storms um, and, and restoration times. Uh, you know, $9 of, of benefit for a single dollar of cost. And outages. Talk about <clears throat> being able to continue selling electricity rather than being out of electricity. I, 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 would, I would characterize it as reduced restoration times following the outage. When, when big storms hit, insulators will break. You know, it's the weakest point in the system, so we'll, we will have outages. But the ability to restore that outage in, you know, a day well, how do you versus get nine two to, weeks. What makes up the nine to one? So the, the, the nine to one cost benefit ratio is comprised of two things. One is um, the reduced, we won't have to replace as many poles. Like I said, this proposal we have, uh, the refined proposal would, would tackle about 69,000 poles. Um, you know, thoughtfully over five years versus in a storm we did 46,000 poles. So that reduced uh, pole replacement expense in future storms is a huge driver uh, of that benefit to cost ratio. The other, the other part is, and this is, this is not scientific, but we all know, I mean, when, when we have storms and outages, your, your, your constituents call you, right? When's my power getting back on? When's it get back on? Do I have to evacuate? So for our customers to be able to have reduced restoration times to know, you know, my power is going to be back on in a day or two. I don't need to, to leave, go get a hotel. I'm not going to lose the contents of my fridge. Those sorts of things are huge benefits to our customers. It's hard to quantify. Uh, the Department of Energy does have um, a calculator that you can plug in the value of an outage. So you can get a number, but I think for our customers, the, the big thing is knowing they can get power restored following major storms pretty quickly. Um, and, and we all, we're gonna have it, but I'd rather restore a customer in a day or two, like Florida did, versus, and Commissioner Francis, two weeks uh, in, in Lake Charles after Laura. What is your rate? What is, uh, I don't know what Brandon is, but uh, there is this measurement they, they measure you on. You know, what is that rate? The, the safety safety score? Yeah. What is it? A safety safety, it's, it's a system average interruption frequency index yeah. and then a duration index. Well, what, are y what is your deal? Uh, I, I don't have the, the numbers in front of me, but I think we are, for 2023, we, we exceeded the commission's requirements. I think we are number three or four uh, in, the, in the state of all the investor owns and all the co-ops. We're probably top three or four in terms of performance on reliability. Um, we, you know, we had significant challenges, particularly in Baton Rouge um, in 2023. Uh, and with, with feedback, you know, we, we kind of did some, some focused efforts on tree trimming, of reliability, and we, we've kind of arrested those issues in Baton Rouge. Um, and I think in 2023, we saw about a 30% improvement um, in our, our, our reliability metrics compared to where we were in 2023. So 
really happy with that, um, but we still have we still have issues in Baton Rouge in particular that we're still focusing on tackling, and we, we look forward to. We want to do more. We need to do more for our customers than a 30% improvement. We need to improve year after year after year. So that's that's our focus. Uh, but we you know we while we're happy that we comply and meet or exceed the commission's uh, reliability requirements. Our customers, they don't measure our performance based on whether we meet that metric or not. They want their lights on, they want service to be restored as quickly as possible, and that's what we're trying to do here. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's my, and, and I know Mr. May has some comments on um, what these reliability hardening investments mean for the state, um, but I just want to let you all know where we are. We have submitted to the parties a proposal for consideration that we think is in the interest of our customers. It's not what we applied for. It's not what we requested. Uh, but it is a, a no regrets type of you know approach that will benefit our customers. These polls that you're buying, uh, Mr. Green was talking about that, making sure that uh, I had heard him, uh, making sure they are resilient. Are, are the polls you're buying now? Tell me about the yeah, polls so, compared to the old polls. So after uh, I guess in the wake of Hurricane. Ida, I'm getting the eyes mixed up, but Ida, we did revise our wind loading standards, our design, uh, design criteria for the southernmost part of the state. So we've elevated, uh, we, we exceed the National Electric Safety Code standards for wind loading and our new standards. So any pole that we install today um, or as part of a hardening program will meet or exceed those new higher wind loading standards. Um, I think generally along the, the, the most coastal areas, um, on the distribution system, it's probably designed to about 150 mile an hour wind loading requirements. Um, and so everything that's installed today, whether it's wood, steel, composite, will meet, meet or exceed that requirement. And, and I will say many of, the, many of the poles installed in 2020 and 2021 um, you know, were more robust than we had had previously, but this new standard even elevates it further. You know, you got one of the things I'm starting to learn is, you know, you've got the co-ops and you've got the investor owns, but you've got industrial and then you've got homeowner, you know. And I know you must have two different departments that analyze and work with those two. Wouldn't that be right if, if we, we want to say, look, we look at your books on what's going on in industrial, what's going on in homeowner. And uh, part of your big growth that we've got coming up is being driven by this industrial, right? Yeah. It, it is, Commissioner. And this is Philip May with Entergy Louisiana. What we're seeing and what's different about this economic growth that we're seeing now is it's going to be spread across the entire state. So even in North Louisiana, we're seeing strong interest in very large projects that have substantial economic development impact. What we're hearing from these customers when we talk to them about what their needs are, whether they're existing customers that are expanding or they're new customers coming to the state, uh, as we touched on earlier, it's reliability, it's, it's resiliency, and it's sustainability. I want to point, point out on the, on the uh, resiliency piece, the important thing is when you talk to these customers, they know that our transmission system will be up and running sooner than the neighborhoods, but they're concerned about the neighborhoods as well because you can't get your plant up and running again if you don't have the employees who can come in and work because they can't have power in their house, they can't be in the area because they had to evacuate because of lack of power, that kind of thing. So it needs to be a comprehensive solution to bring in uh, this growth opportunity in front of us. Well, I'm going to start looking at more of. Uh, you had uh, 46,000 poles. That's that's basically homeowners. And uh, I'm going to see some more information on uh, how many transmission lines and poles that are feeding these large plants where our people work. Uh, so it's two just separate categories, and, and we need to be looking at it two different ways, not just all one. Uh, yeah, and Commissioner, it is, you know, our, our, the assets we've identified, they do also include transmission assets as well because, you know, we had uh, on the 500 kV system following Hurricane Laura, we did have some uh, 500 kV structures go down, which take quite a, quite a bit of time to replace because they're, they're engineered structures. So we are trying to address that as well. And I, and I want to mention, uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention 
Um, some have thought about this accelerated hardening program as we're going to be pulling out all the poles we put in after Laura, Delta, Zeta, and Ida. That's, that's not the plan. Um, the, the average age of the assets we've targeted in this uh, refined proposal, uh, average age of a pole <laughs> is 30 years. Uh, some, are, some are older, some are a little bit newer, but on average, the assets that have been identified as benefiting from a higher wind loading standard uh, are about 30 years. And so at the end of this five-year program, they're going to be 35 years. So you know, they're going to need to be replaced eventually. We'd rather do it in blue sky conditions. We have a, a very large uh, workforce ready to work on this, uh, anxious to work on this. and. You know, they can tackle these 69,000 poles uh, in blue sky conditions and not in, in the heat of, you know, the wake of a storm where, you know, to, to lodge them, to feed them, to get them here is incredibly, you know, expensive and difficult, so. All right, Commissioner Ray. Uh, I just want to thank y'all because I had my pole viability docket, still have it, and I asked, uh, at first I wanted to complete it before we start this, and then we agreed, no, just keep mine five or 10 yards ahead of what y'all are trying to do. And I wanna thank you for honoring that. Um, I'm particularly excited about the idea and the concept of what we have moving forward. As I mentioned earlier, for a more resilient Louisiana, but also uh, I'm grateful, and maybe y'all didn't have a choice, but that y'all have skin in the game, uh, it looks like, on this round. And I think accountability is very important. And it also tells me that y'all are very confident in what y'all are gonna be able to do. Um, so I think this is a step in a new direction and it's one that's good for ratepayers and, and, and Louisiana in general. So let's keep moving forward. Uh, we, we appreciate that feedback and uh, we have offered to the parties what I would describe and I've, look, I've been at this commission not, not as long as Philip May has been in the industry. I think I was in grammar school when he started. But, um, you know, I've been, I've been here for a while and we've put on the table, I think, a level of accountability, transparency that is unprecedented, not only at this commission, but I would say, um, you know, across the country. And look, it, it, it wasn't an easy thing for us to do, um, to, to get approvals to move forward in that path. But to your point, Commissioner Green, if we are not confident that these assets will perform as expected, Maybe we shouldn't be doing it, but we are that confident. It is that important, and we are willing to, you know, offer up some performance measures that will let customers know, your constituents know that we're serious about this, um, and we're going to stand behind it. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to kind of continue, Mr. Han. I know you may have been in grammar school when Mr. May started. I don't know where I was. I don't think I existed with Mr. Mr. May started, but I want to thank you for your presentation and your information. I mean, I just have a few questions, and I know we have had um, a lot of discussion, and I thank you for, for, for all the work, and I'm not going to get into any of the um, kind of settlement negotiations we've been talking. I just want to see uh, what, what kind of transparency will we be offering, especially about the selection criteria once we get to chosen projects, so, so the, the constituents and public know how we got uh, to those said projects. Yeah, great question because the there is an estimate of what all these things cost and people tend to focus on that estimate and think of it, oh, we're just gonna write you a check for whatever that number is. But what this was a kind of a bottoms up approach to, it's an asset by asset look. So they looked at different feeders, different assets in the distribution system to identify, you know, what is the exposure of that feeder to future storms? What's its wind rating? What's the likelihood of failure? So we have, um, it's about, it's a little over 2,000 specific projects, feeder projects, substations. So we, we do have, we, and, and the parties have a list of those 2,000 projects. They know what it is, where it is, what the cost, oh, they don't, they don't know the cost estimate for each project because, um, while I love our contract partners, our vendors, I don't want them to know what we've estimated it to be. Um, so, you know, they, they, but they know the specific projects. They know the benefits that we estimate for each project. They know what's going to be done. So that level of, of transparency is out there. And, and importantly, I think it's very important for the commission to retain its jurisdiction. This is a, it's not a, if you say yes, and there's no vote today, obviously, there's no settlement, but if you were to say yes, this is not, we're off to the races and we're gonna spend all of it. It's a measured approach and the, you know, we have provisions where the staff, engineering consultants will be watching us all along the way, semi-annual reports, 
And if the commission, for whatever reason, says, slow your roll, pause, we want to rethink the projects, the level of investment, or we want you to do more, that's your purview. And so there's, there are stops and off ramps along the way um, that we built into this to protect your jurisdiction and to make sure the programs, the projects we're doing are really beneficial. Um, we're working on cost estimates, and as we know with inflation, uh, sometimes we don't control what costs do. Um, you know, the, the price of you know metal and, and conductors, things can go up. Um, price of wood, so we, we don't control fully what that is. Uh, but we're going to work closely with our contract partners to manage those costs for customers. Um, but if the commission says along the way that we want you to slow down because we don't think this is the right thing. You know, you have that jurisdiction, retain that jurisdiction. We're not, it's not like a power plant. When you say it's approved, go build it. And we, we tell the contractor to start building it. Once we tell that contractor on a power plant to start building it, there's very significant cost exposure that we're committed to. Here, it's, it's, it's 2,000 different projects. So along the way, if y'all say, I'm not comfortable with this, we can, we can pivot and move away from it. Thank you. And I, I want to say I, I really do appreciate the accountability measures. Um, that you have been offering and you're offering here. I just want to make sure that they are effective um, and they work actually in practice of, with how we want. So I just want to ensure that you will continue to work um, with our staff uh, on the process you're proposing, the information you'll be sharing, um, and that we can all kind of agree to the best ways for us to use uh, working together to ensure that these, progress, these projects progress. And so I just want to make sure that um, that continues and that we, we, we continue those deep uh, conversations. And so I think the last thing that I, I want to say or, or, or mention, I know, and then Commissioner Green mentioned about the series, several ongoing rulemakings that could affect and work on the projects that are being proposed in this package. And so I just want to make sure that on the offset, uh, that these projects would be in no way exempt from um, any of those future rules and that this is not any type of specific carve out but in fact would comply with existing rules and any future rules and so I just want to make sure that you uh, will work with us to ensure that happens as well. I, I, I can affirm today, I don't know what the rules will be, but I can affirm to you we will comply with it. Uh, your rule will say one of two things, do more or do less. In either of those events, we have the off-ramps, the ability, we will comply with whatever that rule is. Um, I can't imagine the rule is going to say do less in terms of hardening and resilience. But if it, if it is less or different, that's what we're committed to do. It might say do more for less. So. <laughs> if, if, I could, if I could figure that map out, I would definitely do it. Well, I, I, I appreciate uh, your work. I, I thank you for still working with me and my staff as we've gone through this, and we'll continue uh, those conversations along the way. Thank you. When are we going to start uh, working on this resilience? I got feel another hurricane coming. God help us. It's, it's, it's so, uh, I mean, clearly, as um, I think this commission has said before, and, and I, I do want to, I, I want to, Quote Paul Zimmering, um, one of the things he always told me was storms are a question of when, not if. Um, that the first storm case I worked on with him, that was what he told me, and it's, it's proven to be true. Um, so time is of the essence, it always is. The, the, the 2024 storm season is going to be on us pretty quickly. Um, we, we, we can't harden the system before that, but we need to start somewhere, and I think the time to start is as soon as possible. Um, yeah, but that said, you know, we have a lot of stakeholders. So you, you, you commissioners are key stakeholders. We have a lot of interveners in the case. Um, and as I, when we met with them, um, I told them, it's, this is not an entergy thing. It's not a commission thing. It's an all of us thing. So whether you're the Alliance for Affordable Energy, any intervener in this, this thing, we, we are making very important policy decisions for the state. We can't make it alone. You can't make it alone. We're all in it together. And if we do it the right way, we're going we're gonna to be in it together. If we, if we decide not to do it or we can't get approval to do it, we're also in that together. Um, and I know when storms happen, the frustration comes at us and it comes at you. Um, but we want to be aligned with all the stakeholders, all the interveners, all the commissioners, because this is a, a matter of you know, critical importance for the state of Louisiana in the future. Um, you know, the, the economic development opportunities we have before us one of the first questions those folks ask is, I'm willing to come invest billions in your state, 
but what are you all doing as a state to become more resilient and hardened? And it, it goes beyond the electric system. It goes to insurance. You know, we, we all know how high homeowners insurance, property insurance is in Louisiana. Uh, and this, I think, is one of the things that can help with the insurance crisis in Louisiana. Look, we're not, we're not fortifying homes. They have fortified roofs, that sort of stuff. But when an insurance company knows we can get lights back on in a day versus two weeks following a major storm, that means they're not going to have entire loss of contents. They're not going to have mold and mildew infestation uh, you know, in, in the home. So everybody's looking at this. Businesses who want to come here, insurance companies, parish leaders, you know, they, they, they're stressed during storms as well. They're trying to provide for emergency services. Uh, and the sooner we can get life back to normal following storms uh, is, is hugely important for the future of the state. So we look forward to working with the stakeholders, the interveners, and I, I'm always optimistic. Um, I have to be. I hope we are, you know, dressed casually in Manny, bringing to you guys a, a, you know, some sort of consensus proposal from all the parties that y'all can consider in April. So I hope to, uh, I will definitely see you in April. I hope to see you with uh, something for y'all to vote on. Bring on us something resilience. so we can get started on this resiliency. We're, our constituents are ready. We, if we get hit with another hurricane there and we haven't made a move, they're going to be wondering, what in the world are we doing? Uh, we got a good plan. We got our eyes on you. Uh, let's get started. We'll rein you in. We're watching you, okay? And we're working with all these interveners. So, uh, well, thank you all for the report. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. I'd like to say, too, that uh, I know you got this big rate increase coming up and all this money being spent. And I've talked to these fellows. Uh, I represent North Louisiana. Yep. I feel like uh, we pay a lot of the bills that we don't have a lot of damage. So I'm going to really be putting my eye on you, not warning you, that you're going to have to spend some money in North Louisiana. You can't spend it all down here and ask us to eat it. Uh, that's what we do. We pay for, we pay for storms we never have. Uh, I've been through that before. But if you're going to have a lot of money to spend, I'm going to be watching you real close that you spend a lot of it our proportion in North Louisiana. Yes, sir. Because I don't feel like we get our fair share now. Not that you do a bad job. And the territory is just different. It's just different. We don't have the storms y'all have. But we pay our bills and we want our... Commissioner, I appreciate that sentiment. I, I can assure you we have a number of projects in North Louisiana. And as I mentioned in our previous discussion, there are economic opportunities associated in that area in which resilience and reliability is going to be a key component of that. If, uh, if you look at the uh, parishes that are suffering, uh, North Louisiana has more than anybody. There's some here, uh, but we have, especially up and down the Mississippi River, uh, some of those parishes have lost 25% population, 25%. And uh, unbelievable. I, I was talking to yesterday a uh, gentleman in Concordia Parish. And, uh, and it goes on and on. I was talking to the man, the head of the uh, co op in Jones. He said when he went to Jonesville, there was 13 lawyers. Today, there is three lawyers. That's the problem that North Louisiana is suffering. And we have to have, if we can get some good industry, and, we, and plus y'all are the, y'all have to be able to do your job and provide yes, the electricity. What's the secret to having fewer lawyers? <laughs> okay, here we go. I, I no people. I mean, can you imagine that though? When he went there, he had 13 lawyers practicing law in Jonesville. Now there's three, one doesn't go to court. You got it's a shame. Two. Okay. Otherwise, well, thank you. Thank you, guys. For thank you, commissioners. Okay. All right, moving on. What are we on, 13? Yeah. Yes, sir. Exhibit number 13 is docket number U36964. This is Entergy's application for modification and combination of energy efficiency rate riders as a discussion and possible vote on the uncontested stipulated settlement pursuant to Rule 57 at the request of Chairman Francis. On August 29th of 2023, Entergy filed its application in accordance with the Commission's rules regarding electric utility tariff filings and related review attachment A to general order dated July 1st, 2019. Notice of the matter was published in the Commission's official bulletin with the Louisiana Energy Users Group timely intervening. 
Staff and Energy were able to enter into a settlement which was filed into the record on March 19th of 2024. The uncontested stipulated settlement is, is if approved by the commission, would resolve all issues related to the application of this docket. Staff and energy support in Lug does not oppose all of the provisions of the stipulated settlement. Staff and energy believe that the settlement presented and is agreed to herein is a reasonable in light of the record, consistent with the law and in the public interest. The major terms are summarized as follows. Energy is authorized to implement the proposed quick start energy efficiency cost rate rider, merging the two legacy rate riders into one, and Energy will combine the report, reporting requirements for the quick start orders applicable to legacy EE rider and submit a single report beginning with the next reporting requirement due under the quick start orders. Staff recommends that the Commission, one, assert its original and primary jurisdiction pursuant to Rule 57 of the Rules of Practice and Procedure, and two, accept the uncontested stipulated settlement filed into the record on March 19th of 2023. Okay. I, I move to step, accept the uncontested stipulated settlement. Well, we need a Rule 57, rule 57 oh, first, please. Well, I motion to, to Rule 57. And I second that. And, okay. And so we have a motion by Commissioner Lewis, uh, say goodbye. Uh, microphones are not oh. on. Motion by Commissioner Lewis, seconded uh, by Chairman to move to Rule 57. So then we have another motion. Uh, I'll move to accept staff's recommendation. And second by the Chair. Is there any discussion or opposition? Hearing none, the motion passed. Exhibit number 14 is undocketed. It's a discussion with Southwest Water Company regarding water issues in and around the village of Fruit Settlement at the request of Commissioner Scrimetta. And I, if representatives from Southwest Water would like to Anybody come up. From Southwest here? Is there attorney from Southwest here? And uh, is everything good now on the, okay, here we go. All right, now come on up. Mr. Scametta has a question for you. Yeah, uh, just wanted to uh, uh, just wanted to clarify that um, the parish president's chief of staff had requested this opportunity to come and have a discussion with you. They're not here now, as my understanding, and that's been resolved. My my understanding is that uh, Jim is not here. Unless he showed it, up in the behind. Any, any representatives from Livingston Parish here? Okay. So did the we did, have had conversations with him, uh, and we believe we resolved some of his issues. Um, and this was on the consumer complaint uh, telephone lines. I think with it was your the company? customer service. Customer and service stuff. And I, wait time. I have Melissa here who can speak to some of okay. that. Some of that and kind of the changes that we have made uh, most immediately. Right. Hi. So what we've done I'm is sorry, we've in, allocated. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Just say okay. your name. Melissa Rich. <clears throat> I'm vice president of operations for Southwest Water. Okay. Uh, what we've done in the immediate present is to allocate a couple of additional customer service reps to have them assist uh, taking calls for the current staff that we have in place. And uh, once the merge is complete, we will be hiring additional uh, customer service reps for French settlement or for the Louisiana calls. Well, a uh, couple of things. First off, when you came last month, yes, um, I thought that the message was pretty clear that y'all were gonna get it all sorted out. And right after that, we still had the same problems with customer service line and that the uh, parish president uh, of Livingston Parish was on, made the calls, his yes. chief of staff made the calls, okay. and they were still not getting the contact back from the customer service line. So, you know, pardon us for questioning your sincerity on making sure that y'all were gonna fix the problem. Right. So, number one. Uh, number two is, and so I hope y'all are serious about fixing this. And then the second thing is, and since that time, it's my understanding that uh, French Settlement Water, which is run by Southwest Water. Southwest is now going to merge with Utilities Inc. Correct. And uh, at the national level. Correct. And that the um, the state operator of French Settlement will now be Utilities Inc. in the future? Uh, that That is correct. They will be the new leadership for 
Louisiana. Okay. So it, is it uh, safe to assume that you're probably going to take over French Settlement Water as Utilities, Inc.? Yes. Okay. Um, the, the, the leadership that is in place for Utilities, Inc. will be the one that takes over. For okay. French and Settlement. so, uh, Ms. Cantrell, you're going to be working with I'll council working about uh, bringing the, con the terms of the merger and all to staff so the commission can review all that. Right, right? we'll be filing and compliant with the 94 general order. Okay, staff's okay with everything at this point? Uh, I, I don't know anything other than what was just said, so I, mean, I would like to at least look at it and, and have a better understanding of, of all the, right. the parameters. Because I was surprised that staff didn't know about it and I was able to discover it because you hadn't told us about it. So. We need to be have a little bit more open dialogue about things like this to make sure we're all on the of same course. page. Of course, the parent companies of both French Settlement, and that stock was transferred to Louisiana Water Utilities in 2022, and UIL, that closing of kind of an upstream, those parent companies are it is scheduled to occur and be final April 1st. And right, so, well, I found out about it in a restaurant I, in I Livingston, it, Louisiana. When I so. met with you and talked about the name change and why that was waiting to happen post later yeah, but was about because this, we were waiting for this to This occur. merger issue was new, so and that's I, the part. I'm, so. That's what I just want to make sure the staff doesn't know anything about it. Well, they clearly we, had no knowledge. We had filed with the staff that the parent companies and the upstream business combination between Southwest and Corix was was occurring. We fed, we filed that letter of non opposition, which was approved in May of 2023. After all the states, uh, which are you know 15 plus, got their individual approvals. We were then going to then come and file if indeed the merger between Southwest, I mean between French Settlement, what is now French Settlement and UIL would occur. We fully appreciate that that would needed approval by the commission, um, but that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I, I think that there's some missing parts to this puzzle that have not been kind of keeping the staff council uh, in, engaged in this issue, and I appreciate you being more forthright with what's happening so we can be on target to make sure that this doesn't get delayed in process for the value of your company. And, and did I understand that it's happening April 1st? The All of the states are supposed to be approved on the 15 states April 1st on the piece that the, this commission also got the letter non up May of 2023. May of 2023, all of those other states are supposed to have similar approvals. The merger between UIL and French Settlement won't occur until after we come and file the letter of non opposition. Okay, that, that, that's okay. I think that clears it up yeah, for us. That, yeah, well, I, part I, of it. I, I want to make sure from this point forward you're more engaged with staff counsel on this to make sure that there's no gaps on this, okay? okay. And in the meantime, I would appreciate you bumping up your consumer uh, response for the folks there and. Uh, Trying to engage this. And when Utilities Inc. takes over, I'd like to meet with them on this issue. Of course. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For coming. So the last agenda item is exhibit number 15. It is a resolution for authorization of the commission to provide letters of support for some of the electric cooperatives. And the resolution reads as follows. The Louisiana Public Service Commission pursuant to its constitutional authority regulates the rates, terms, and conditions of service of both investor-owned and not-for-profit electric utilities providing service to industrial, residential, and commercial customers in Louisiana. Whereas the electric cooperative members of the Association of Louisiana Electric Cooperatives or ALEC include Beauregard Electric Cooperative, Claiborne Electric Cooperative, Dixie Electric Membership Corporation, Jefferson Davis Electric Cooperative, South Louisiana Electric Cooperative Association, Washington Santami Electric, all distribution cooperatives regulated by the Louisiana Public Service Commission. Whereas in, in a first of its kind compromised of all six of these Louisiana Electric Cooperative members formed a Louisiana coalition to apply for the Department of Energy Grid Resilience and Innovation Partnership Program, or GRIP. Whereas the project strives to solve the grid resilience challenges that threaten the state of Louisiana's economic viability, vitality, excuse me, and promote remote rural disadvantaged communities from increased climate related threats and external risk what? that compromise energy safety, reliability, and resilience. Whereas all six of the cooperatives in the coalition have been affected by at least one, if not more, named disasters in the past three years, including hurricanes and severe winter storms. 
whereas a set of projects is focused on the following goals and investments. One, climate risk mitigation by hardening aging power infrastructure through wood to steel pole replacement substation upgrades, advanced reconductoring and undergrounding of distribution lines to reduce the duration and frequency of power, out power outages, enhance energy security by creating redundant loop transmission systems and piloting emerging grid technologies, clean energy access by deploying clean distributed energy resources, community resilience hubs and microgrids, workforce sustainability by workforce and apprenticeship programs to foster power sector growth within disadvantaged communities, community outreach and participation in women and minority business enterprises and local contractor participation goals to elevate economic growth in communities, relive, relieve energy burden through advanced meter infrastructure and switching technologies to reduce cooperative costs and power disaster expenditures. Whereas these impacts we felt across the state as this coalition provides energy services to 33 of the 64 Louisiana parishes. Whereas the commission has been working with, working and will continue to work to ensure that the electric utilities under its jurisdiction provide safe, reliable service to Louisiana citizens at the lowest reasonable cost. And whereas the commission continues these efforts by supporting the utilities efforts to secure funding that would reduce the economic burden of resiliency projects, especially for disadvantaged communities. Now, there, now therefore be it resolved that the Louisiana Public Service Commission urges and requests that the United States Department of Energy to consider the issues addressed herein and approve the application of the above named electric cooperatives for funding in order that the same can address essential infrastructure investments which will ultimately benefit the ratepayers and citizens of Louisiana. Okay, the chair recognizes uh, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I just wanted to say I, I'm honored to um, offer this resolution with you. As I've mentioned multiple times, the investment from the IIJA and the IRA gives Louisiana a great opportunity to improve our electric system in this state. We've had significant conversations today about resiliency, reliability, uh, and affordability, and I believe this project um, that the co-ops have introduced uh, will help and, and truly bring uh, needed resources to Louisiana. I thank them uh, for proactively uh, applying, just as we have done this uh, a resolution like this for Intergy Louisiana, uh, for doing the same, which I also thank. And so uh, just uh, for, for the record, this project um, is requesting around $151 million, and the co-op's match would only be 33%. Um, so Louisiana, um, uh, Louisiana would see a significant investment that, at, that does not cost our ratepayers and the co-op significant amount of money. And so uh, I want to thank the co-op and their leadership uh, on this and, 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 the, and the work that Louisiana is doing to be the leader to receive as many funds as we can from the Department of Energy and the federal government in this investment. And so at, at the right time, I would move uh, adoption of this resolution, Mr. Chairman. I got a question for that. Uh, look, look, look those numbers. Is that 33 percent? Yes, sir. The co-ops met. The, so the anticipated total project budget would be uh, 220, just about 226 million dollars, uh, and they have requested from the federal government around 151.3 million dollars, and so their match would be just 33 percent. Sound like a good deal, but it is going to be. Uh, they probably have to raise their rates a little to to generate that money, wouldn't it? Probably. I'm not, I, I would welcome any of the co-ops to, I, I'm not sure of that answer, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Where, you, where would the co-ops get the money? And while they're coming up, I know when, when this was discussed last year, when this, this application was put in, and, and I think it's essentially similar, um, some of them may have been able to hand it through their existing line of credits, and I think that was one question, since they borrow from the federal government through CoBank or, or, or US, would that be a violation or, or be prohibited, but but I think that hurdle was cleared, and I don't know if they're if you listening that that they could they could use essentially their existing line of credits, or if they had to get a loan from CoBank, that wouldn't be considered using federal dollars to to. So that's the route I believe they were going. If you borrow, money, I, I see Addie shaking her head. Yes. So if you borrow money, do you have to pay it back? Yes. So that would have to be recovered yes. from ratepayers, yes. from the yes. co-op members. It, so it, it, it would either it, how do you, if it's addition. How, how does a co-op recover money? Do they raise rates on their members? They, they would if it would be a new. That's what I'm saying. If, yeah. if some might have the. So is the there ability. an obligation under this? I mean, I have no problem with the resolution, right. but 
it's a choice they get to make later if they get the option. Yeah, they'd have to file an application with us okay. to, to get right. any approval for a line of credit, et cetera. Yeah. Yes, Got that's it. correct. So you'd, you'd probably have a board of directors approval uh, to accept that. Uh, so the board representing the people, uh, if they wanted to raise their rates in order to get this benefit, uh, sound like a reasonable deal to me. Does the board but it's get under the, the Public Service Commission really wouldn't vote. It would be the board of directors of the co-ops. Wouldn't that be right? Well, if they, if they come in for a line of credit or, or any additional borrowing, then that would require our approval. I mean, we'd have to approve what their board of directors yeah, ask. Board, board would be okay. first. All right. So it's still uh, it, it's back in the hands of the locals. Yeah, okay, that's board, what I wanted. The board, you know, can, uh, the board can. You know, I, I would support the, uh, the resolution, and I think, uh, Commissioner Schmeider, you had something else? Yeah, I just had a quick question because so the, the, for the staff. resolution is approved. Right. Yeah. It's a question for staff. Uh, I guess, Colby, you may have been monitoring this. I'd like an update on, I'm not sure of the bill number, the Senate bill, is it 180 or 108? 108. Um, yeah, 108. Just on just, uh, the, sort of the basis of it and kind of where we are on this because of how it affects the commission. And so kind of give me a, a kindergarten primer on it. Okay, so um, as I appreciate it, and, and, I, and I've, I've reviewed this and, and sat in the committee hearing, there was, there was a bill introduced to uh, modify situation w it's in which a utility specifically for the purposes of um, building transmission lines can use expropriation authority. So it would be a modification to the expropriation statutes um, that, are, that exist in law. And, and basically the way it was written was if a line was being built that did not provide the majority, I think is the way it was stated, of power within the state, then you couldn't use expropriation authority under the existing statute. Um, there was a modification made to it in committee that essentially would um, exempt out projects that were in an RTO uh, approved process. Um, so it, it passed out a committee with, with that language included therein. Um, I think it passed the full Senate day before yesterday. Um, so it's it's now on the House side, and we'll be get. Ref we'll, I think it was just referred to committee as well on the House side. Right. So, so, so how does that in, uh, impact the commission, and how does it impact the general sort of interrelation on transmission as we are? That's a difficult question. You know, <laughs> well, that's why I asked it, you. So, so looking I can at ask it, Catherine in, it, in, in its form. Um, obviously, there's concerns. Uh, you know, the commission. Uh, we don't handle expropriation or property disputes. Right. However, w what could or could not happen there could trickle down to the commission. Um, with the amendment, it's better. It has less impact on the commission, but I could still see it having unintended consequences down the road. If, if for example, another state would implement a similar type of rule, it could chill or, or have an impact on transmission being built in other states, which may benefit Louisiana, not that state. How, how does this jibe with the FERC obtaining backstop authority anyway against state authority? Uh, not getting into the weeds on that, I, it's my appreciation that there, there are some serious concerns that this will be violative of, of the FERC's primacy on, the, on these issues and maybe a violation of federal law. Okay. What, what does this bill exactly Sum it up for me. As, as, it, as it's written now, um, if a transmission line is being built across the state and there is no, or, well, not say no, if the majority of the power that being, is being transmitted on that line is not being consumed in the state, and I know there was discussion about what that means, the majority of the power, then the builder of that line cannot use expropriation authority to take property. Um, they could negotiate still, but they wouldn't have the ability to expropriate someone's land if they didn't want to negotiate with them. That's, a, that's the same thing we're talking about. It's the same highline of the same transmission line that's going all across North Louisiana that we don't get one kilowatt of electricity out of, not one. And. Uh, Oh. That's what I want us to make all the transmission lines come here. Right today, I don't think they have to. You're saying, some people say, some of your staff said, oh, we don't have jurisdiction, blah, 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 blah. 
but we have a rule coming up that says they have to come here to get permission. Isn't that correct? That, that's correct. There is a proposed rule out there that you will uh, will be presented for y'all to vote on to expand our transmission siting order, which deals more with the not the physical siting, but the public interest siting, I guess is the best way to say it. Right. Well, I'm for that. I think that anybody that comes across the state of Louisiana needs to come by us and talk to us if you've got a big transmission line. That, that makes good sense. It, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, is this under the, in the same category of an, uh, a pipeline that crosses Louisiana the same way under the federal regulations? Uh, yes or no? I would say yes. Okay. I know there, there was discussion about that, whether this was pipeline as well. And, and, and that particular proposed statute um, is only dealing with, with transmission. I, I mean, expropriation authority would go to pipelines as well, certain types of pipelines. I know certain types have expropriation authority, others don't. Oh, okay. But I'm definitely not an expert on that. <laughs> I don't know I'm an expert on any of this. I'm just going to tell you what I think. I'm, I'm showing the humility. I, guess, that, uh, I, I, I can see some federal lawyers showing up this thing. Uh, yeah, yeah and, and Mr. Chairman, I just want to put on the record that while uh, in, in respect of the current proposed project, I did have some concerns with Senate Bill 108 for what it means about interregional transmission and interregional transmission planning. As we know, transmission will be one of our biggest tackles. So I have gone uh, publicly on record with the members of the Senate and the House that I am opposed uh, to Senate, one, Senate Bill 108. So I just wanted to let my colleagues know that I have uh, submitted official opposition to my uh, legislative delegation on this proposed legislation. You're not for it. Uh, I can wait a question. Huh? Is, is, uh, is anybody from uh, I Patton here? Just, uh, I think Pat Henry Belton. I don't know if he's here today. Actually, we do have people here. There's from someone Patton. here for the uh, representing the uh, the transmission line. Company. Yes, they are. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, because uh, they can tell me more for what, what's going on. So, yes. Appreciate uh, y'all. Turn on the mic and introduce yourself. Yeah. Inside oh, Della Carta. Hit the button. Give us your name. There we go. Thank Commissioners you. Adam Renz, Director of Development, Pattern Energy. Adam, thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Kyle Marino and John Grant and Council for Pattern okay. and the matter that's before the Public Service Commission. And? John Grant, I'm with Marino Cantro as well. Okay. Let me ask a question. Sorry. Kyle, uh, uh, I, 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 I know y'all are not for the bill, right? That's correct. Okay. This has nothing to do with the bill. But you're not going to object that the Public Service Commission, you've told me this, let's get this on the record. I have a, a proposal coming up. Tell them what it says. It, well, I think the parties have already had an opportunity to comment on it. Ms. Evans, um, I know you showed me the language. I don't know off the top of my head. But, it, but we had a directive back in January, I believe, to put this proposed language in the existing rulemaking. It's my appreciation that went out for comments and comments were received from, I believe, three or four parties. So staff should be going forward with this recommendation here shortly. Basically, what does it say? You, win, you, you beat around the bush. Tell them no, what the hell so thing says. So under, under our order, um, there was an exception on our, like, I'm going to call it public interest criteria for transmission siting. Uh, there was an exception if there was no off taker or no power being provided in the state off of the line, it's going to remove that exception essentially. I think our say, irrespective of whether it's providing power in the state, it would, our rules would still apply. Basically what it says, if you're coming across the state of Louisiana with a transmission line, you got to come by the Public Service Commission. That's all. We well, got to know and, about it. And Commissioner, just to be clear on the record, yeah. uh, Southern Spirit Transmission, which is a subsidiary pattern, voluntarily filed an application uh, earlier in the year to come before the commission and asking for it to be to certified it. without you guys changing the certification order. So yeah, so we don't oppose that. We do oppose, and we said that in the matter, any kind of delay of our matter, which has already gone to hearing, you know, based on that. Well, because we've already come and asked for your certification or, or a, you know, a, or a determination that it's exempt. But there will be a vote whether or not you can come across the state. That, that's going to be, you're going to have to do that. 
because what you're doing here, it's only affect North Louisiana, but it could affect everybody. You're coming across the state from Logan Sport to the Mississippi River, building a, a transmission line that you won't tell who's getting electricity. You, 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 know, you, you don't ever tell us that. I've been through it the whole deal. I've heard all the speeches. So the money's coming from a trust fund or something in California teachers. They're coming across the state. They, we're not going to get one kilowatt of electricity out of it. Yeah, good. You basically don't tell us what's going on. And now yeah, I just want to rule that you have to be able to vote and get permission to come across. Yeah. Other lines come across the state of Louisiana. You have to be permission to get a permission. You do on pipelines. Where's Bobby Gillum? Bobby's in the back. He's hiding in the back. He's back there. I see. So go ahead. You're the back. No, commissioners, uh, the, you guys now get to experience, and I know you. many of you have heard it before, the, how I bore my wife and everyone else around me around transmission planning. Um, I do just want to set a few things just on the record straight. Um, as Kyle mentioned, first and foremost, I think that this project, Southern Spirit Transmission, absolutely falls underneath the commission's purview. And that is in our our filing, right? I mean, that's one of the pieces well, of- Well, then you won't have any objection to what I'm trying to pass. Uh, I believe there is some phrasing in the, the, the amendment and one of the, or sorry, in the new citing order would change some things on the rules. We've been working on this project together with many with members of this commission for nearly a decade and more with prior commissioners so changing the rules we've spent to date a hundred million dollars on this project the vast majority of that is in the state of louisiana we've been playing by the rules that have been out where, there where in the, in the current you, citing order wait a minute man come on yes, where do you spend a hundred million on it 40 million dollars is in non-refundable hvdc converter stations what is that HVDC converter station. So one of the billion dollar pieces of infrastructure we placed at? in DeSoto Parish. You've already spent that? You yes, have built, you, you've got it built? Yes, it's not built, it's on. No. It's a five year build cycle. Oh yeah, I know, I got it, I but got it. it. And you got two permanent jobs, I don't, but we'll put it yes. off to when it comes up. I got the picture, you spent 40 million in the air, you spent 40 million, you've contacted all these Polish juries. I haven't had one call from a Polish jury saying to support it. I don't really care. Hey, Commissioner, I guess one of the pieces I just want to, and I, I'm not looking for handouts or sympathy or empathy on this. We do, being transparent is critical to me. And as you know, we, ha we started a year ago, year, almost a year and a half ago, we had, I think, nine, maybe 12, between nine and 12 interveners in our project, all of which in your district. We are now down to one. And I take that as a personal win, and I am blindly optimistic and naive as a developer. That's my job. So I think we're going to close that. The interveners, now you, what you're telling me. Yes, sir. Now everybody in my area up there is for it. You're correct. I'm saying we've taken formal interveners down from a dozen to one. Yeah, for, formal interveners. But let me tell you what this thing is doing. It's going across. Your, that's the big property owners. Mm -hmm. This thing goes all across North Louisiana. People got 30 acres, 20 acres, 10 acres, and stuff. They don't even know about the damn project. This project is way below radar. Now you can say, well, of course we put it in the paper, we've done all this. Wait till you really start having all these meetings. And they find about, I've only had one Polish jury, DeSoto Parish, call last week, one, one call, and said, we're for it because you're gonna build something in Logansport. That's basically it. Sir, I, Listen, I can't correct, I can't, I can't, I can't argue with anything you're saying. I know that we have more than 50 full-time Louisiana employees in our Monroe office. Or they're working, yeah, but that's, that's where you're spending the money. What you're no. talking about, we've spent all, you have we 15 people working. We have acquired 50 per, nearly 50% 50 of the right-of-way for the state of, for this in the state of Louisiana. And if paid landowners for it, Commissioner, and I, and I might add, you know, and I'll push back on one of the things you said that they're not aware of it. Over time, over the years, they have sent regular notices to the landowners who may be affected of the project. Yeah. So to suggest it's unknown to the landowners, I mean, unless they're you know not opening their mail, um, it, it just it can't be true. And one of their pieces is, and I know this, 
Joe Shine and I have talked about this. I, Joe Shine's out of the situation. Okay, my question is, there's letters that we've Joe, sent from Doyle Land Services Joe, you, testifying you to $20 hey, million dollars of pieces, like of, of spend in the state of Louisiana. We have two Louisiana-based land acquisition companies that have each built tens of thousands of natural gas pipelines. Part of it is, this is a project that is no impact to future ratepayers. So we can take our time. I take a lot of pride in how our route is well, not just like finding. Let me just ask you a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Since yeah. you're coming across Louisiana, we're not getting one kilowatt of electricity. Is that correct? It is going to be interconnected into is MISO that, South that load correct? zone. That is incorrect. Not, it, it's not correct. Uh, it is correct. No, sir. It's Where not. is it going to? It might go to. That's what you're saying. Well, so one of the pieces of going to a FERC-regulated common carrier project is we have to go through what's called an open solicitation process that is supervised by third party outside pieces. So if uh, a Clico or an Entergy or anyone wanted to procure power, a third party has to supervise that to ensure that Southern Spirit or Pattern Energy can't put our fingers on the scale to prohibit someone who wants power from getting power. That's a process that happens and is triggered at the FERC level at a later date. Step one, and that brings us back to the commission, is just thoughtfully going through the permitting process. We're required to go through the PSC process in Mississippi and Texas. We already have Texas approved. What about Mississippi? Did you get their approval? Now, wait we, a minute now, hold up now. Don't yes, say sir. something yes, you don't want to back up. You got Correct. Mississippi's approval? No, sir, we uh -oh. are waiting. And we, we are waiting for a final scheduling order. As you all know, we lost, in the last election cycle, the entire commission. So we are starting from scratch. We have a meeting next week with uh, Governor Reeves and we're continuing to brief and work. We're actually waiting on, it's, I believe it's coming soon, there is a UPC report that is being delivered to uh, Joe, the team at the Mississippi Public Service Commission, and that is due in the next two weeks. Could I have a minute? Don't get Bobby Gillum. Oh, oh, I have one question. Okay, all right. Oh, hold on, oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I hear what you're saying, but I want somebody to. Okay, that's that, listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, do, I got you. I got you. Commissioner, would you mind? I, I want to talk about something. something really quick while we wait for Bobby. Uh, I, I just for, for my for my colleagues. I, I while I appreciate this debate, and I think this is a good. In, I want to remind us that uh, Senate Bill 108 that I think we started the discussion on does pertain to any project, not specifically this project. And I want to be clear. While this project is still under review and I have still not made any determination, my opposition to Senate Bill 108 is that it will harm our process of even looking at interregional transmission because this is, yeah. what I'm fearful of is having the legislature make legislative decisions around transmission planning on one particular issue when this could impact a significant amount of issues. And as we've talked earlier with Intergy and the other companies, uh, transmission and baseload growth is going to be a significant problem for us. And we can't only think about generation, we have to think about transmission. Uh, and so that is, while I appreciate this debate and I'm going to yield back to my, my, my colleague, I wanted to be very clear that when I oppose Senate Bill 108, it has nothing to do with this project because I have not evaluated it because it hasn't come towards us yet, but it has to do that it does harm the entire process of interregional transmission uh, projects and planning for the future of Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would like Bobby Gillum to get in on this. Uh, Bobby, this man was uh, saying, this gentleman here, was saying that uh, there's only nine interveners in the case. All of them but one have agreed to going along with what they're trying to sell, the Highline uh, project in North Louisiana. And uh, I don't think that's true. I, I'm not calling, I'm t I think there was a mistake. I certainly wouldn't dispute your integrity. I think there's a big mistake. Mr. Gillum represents some of those people, and I don't think you've hollered calf rope yet, have you? No, no sir. Uh, well, tell, tell us a little bit about Mr. this program. Gillum. Uh, Bobby, let, just a quick question. Uh, are you representing uh, some of the landowners, or, or uh, there, there's a there's a landowner or two that they have another they have lawyers, but they have asked for 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 assistance from Mr. McCartney and I on on, on certain issues, and we are we are providing that for who you McCartney. Uh, yes, Jonathan McCartney, in my, I in want my you, firm. In I, my firm. I, I, what I was saying is that they're coming across Louisiana. We have no real clear where they're saying, well, we're going to, 
If we get one kilowatt of electricity, we haven't been able to get that out of them, have we? No, sir. No, sir. In fact, what, what the project is, is designed is like no other transmission project I've ever seen, ever. It's going across the entire state from the Mississippi River to Texas, and not one kilowatt of electricity is being delivered to anybody in the state. And Mr. Marino just said, so well, they will, but they, nobody knows when it's going. They don't know anything about this project. I mean, they can talk, but is it hard to get straight answers from these folks? Not, not personally, but from the company. Yeah, from, for, for the purpose of the project and all, it has been, been uh, it's been difficult to get, get what we need. When, when you're a public utility and you file for condemnation or, or seek you know, routing authority, you got to jump through a lot of hoops. And one of the key hoops is you've got to show the public need and necessity for this project. You can't just go take property and build things and, and, and affect landowners. But you have to have a reason. You have to have a public purpose that all benefit from. This one, on the surface, for Louisiana, it may benefit others, but it is not providing any benefit to Louisiana at this time. Maybe they'll try something else later, and we've got mixed answers on that when we ask that question. But there is no, there is no public purpose for Louisiana, as we would define it, in the Constitution provided in, in this project at all. And, and the routing and how you do it and all that, you know, they can make their, their, their determinations. But when you ask them, or where are you gonna provide service to somebody here? Well, no, we don't have plans now. We can't do that now. What are we gonna do in the future? We don't know. But you know that's that's, that's been my whole get. dilemma here, is that I, I, I had somebody we all know working with them, and he told me in a meeting that he has met with all the police juries across North Louisiana. You remember that, Bobby? I said, you met with them all? Oh, yeah, every one of them's for it. I said, well, that's funny. Uh, I, I might be one of the most active public service commissioners up there, and I hear from them all the time. I never heard from them. I heard from uh, uh, DeSoto the other day. That's the first time. I, uh, Red River, they had a meeting. I don't think they were for it in Red River Parish. That's, that's the drift I got. But what I'm saying is, uh, if you got a good project, fine. But there's no way in the world, as the public service commissioner, we ought to have a say-so of where you're going across. We ought to know all about it. We do on everybody else. All of a sudden, y'all come into town and representing a uh, company from California is putting up the money. I don't know. There's a lot of unanswered questions. But, and as far as everybody saying mm -hmm. we, they all know about it, I don't believe that. I don't believe it. But, 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 excuse me, Commissioner. If I, if I may ask staff yes. really quickly, uh, just procedurally where we're at on this, because I, I did sit through this hearing, and I know I have read the transcript from the hearing, and I believe we are at post-hearing brief. So can you, uh, just as part of this conversation, clarify exactly where we're at on the process of the application. So that, that is exactly yeah. where we are at. Post-hearing briefs were filed, I believe, last week. Um, I'm going to... I saw John's could, email, so that's could, why, why it's on my but mind. I, but I, I'm almost positive they were filed last week, um, and the ALJ will take everything under recommendation and or, or under consideration and file a recommendation. It, no, that can take, a, from what I heard, I was not at the hearing. This one was a lengthy hearing, so her recommendation probably will take a little bit to come out. Um, I did the parties waive uh, it, the, the proposed recommendation? It was uh, reply briefs, that, so all the briefings in uh, last week, you're right. And um, we, the proposed wasn't waived, but the time period was shortened. Okay. Um, so the proposed recommendation, final recommendation, then it comes to you guys. Um, so right now we're waiting on the proposed recommendation from the ALJ. What is the verbiage of that, Mr. Uh, the verbiage. Tell me what. Tell me what the verbiage is. I want to know exactly what it says. What, what You're talking it. Well, okay. It's not out yet. The, the ALJ well, hasn't. But I think we're confusing two issues here. We've got two dockets going on. Well, actually three. Just wait. There'll be more. We've got. <laughs> we've got the Senate bill. We've got a rulemaking docket on modifying our existing rule. Um, I'm going to defer to staff on when that's coming out. We also have 
this hearing were pattern filed requesting either certification or a waiver, that's in front of the ALJ. That's what Catherine's talking about. That may take a couple of months or more. Um, the rulemaking, I'm deferring to staff on that, where that one is. You're asking about the rulemaking, I think. I'm asking, yes, that's what I want a rule that says that if there is a transmission line coming across the state of Louisiana, it has to be okayed by the Public Service Commission. I don't think that's too, too much to ask. You know, let the chips fall where they may. If it comes commission, to commission, and then it, it doesn't impact us. We've already filed. We've already filed the application. So that, that rulemaking doesn't impact us. It Mr. just does Hang on one second. This, this, that's, sure that's the rule you said you didn't right. you didn't object to. I don't. We already filed for your approval. You don't object to it. I don't. I didn't. It's for future projects. We think it's great, but it work. We've been working under the current signing order for the last decade. So okay. getting shifted midstream at the end of the process, I think, was what we had formally objected. So, I think so. So maybe let me let me help try to clarify for you, Commissioner Campbell. We have a transmission signing order that. They came in and voluntarily, because, because right now it does not require them to come in. But they, See, they came did, in. Wait, wait a minute, wait, wait. hold up. They came in and you told them, somebody in the staff told them, this doesn't apply to you. So, so that is a pending. That's what but, you but, told but, but that is a pending docket in front of an ALJ right now. So I don't want to get into all of the the substance and the, and the particulars of, of that because the ALJ, it's in the ALJ's hands and she hasn't ruled yet. But but so that is a pending docket in front of us that pattern has not opposed. There is a proposed statute over in the legislature. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. That that's what they're opposing. But they're not opposing the commission's rules or the commission's orders. Is that right, Kyle? Yeah. Whoa, 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 we're well, looking at him now. His eyes are walled up. I can see the movie. Thinking about what you're oh, saying. Oh, yeah. Now let's have a little truth. That's accurate. We don't oppose it. We filed common sentence. So, I mean, I were completely on the record and to look for one sentence. You do me. not oppose I, the rule that says before you come across the state of Louisiana, you have to have permission from the Public Service Commission. I don't because we filed the application before you even changed it. I mean, I, can I oh, say it three oh, times? I, I got right you. Here. Now we got. Now, now we're talking about. Here's the real yeah. deal. Yeah. He said, "I got in before the rule changed." That's what no, you said. that's not that's what I'm saying. Exactly. Exactly. You didn't need to change let me, the rule. Let me, uh, let me tap in here, Commissioner Campbell. Yeah, go ahead. Because I look, I agree with Commissioner Campbell in a large part about this. Okay, and I have, I'm kind of, I'm genuinely agnostic about this transmission line because I don't care if you build it or not. I think you should build it according to avoid any issues you have with the interveners. And you know what? If you got to make it look like a zigzag pattern on a World War II destroyer, you build it around the guy who doesn't want it on his property. And if it costs you an extra $5 million to do it, build it whichever way you got to build it and satisfy the gentleman to his needs and build it however you got to do it. But my problem is the following. You want to build a transmission line across the state of Louisiana that's not going to deliver power to the state of Louisiana, number one. But what you have said to me is, in the future, you may want to drop power off of that line. We're going to then be faced with a transmission line that exists in Louisiana that we did not deal with the costs associated with it, et cetera, that you're going to want to drop power off and then talk to us about collecting a fee associated with the use of that power line. What I want from you in the world of horse trading 101 is I want you to donate the value of use of that transmission line to the people of the state of Louisiana that in the future, if you ever drop off of that line, that we don't get charged for the use of that transmission line. Because you can build it, you can do whatever you want, you get your recovery however you do it from the other states, but if you drop off that line and you sell power to the people of the state of Louisiana, well, I don't see any reason for us to pay for anything other than the power because we'd have, if we were gonna do it for the value of bringing it in in the beginning, then we would be looking at the cost association, the cost associated with the construction. And if we doing it with giving y'all a waiver and saying, knock yourself out, we are not going to be dealing with that and we're gonna let you have a free run. So I would rather say, hey, I think you're doing a great job serving the people of Texas and Mississippi and potentially the TVA and wherever you're gonna go with this power or trying to jump into the Amazon DLE in Mississippi, whatever you wanna do. But 
you're doing it, and then after the fact, considering the potential of selling power into Louisiana down the road, I want value for the people of the state of Louisiana, and if you want to make a deal, I'm all about that. But I think that, number one, you have to satisfy the issue of the landowners mm -hmm. and the interveners, and thank you for admitting that you're subject to the rules. And I think that the legislature needs to understand and understand from this moment that the whole plan along this thing was we were going to get the vote on it, and you didn't have the, uh, the votes counted before you came in to approve this thing. Because you can't say you had all the votes, because you know you don't have all the votes. So we have to look at how we have to understand the value proposition of this for the interveners, the value proposition for the people who had their rights acquired, what it does for the state, and what it could do for the state. So that's how I'm looking at this thing, because otherwise I'm agnostic on this thing. But I don't want to see people in the state of Louisiana hurt. I don't want to see landowners malaffected. And I, and I don't want to see us get back-ended which I think is a way to look at this from down the road of a transmission line that gets built with a FERC-related ROE of over 12.5% with potentially uh, the uh, debt uh, recovery of uh, ROE on debt of a double leveraging of equity, which the state of Louisiana bans, but the FERC does not ban, and you can do that on your debt. And I want to see all that done, and then you come in and say, well, we got to collect those fees on drop-off transmission, drop-off distribution to the citizens of Louisiana. I want to avoid all that. So that's kind of where I am on this, and I'm done. First and foremost, commissioners, I, I know this. I actually genuinely love this uh, because as someone who this is like going from playing uh, fantasy football to getting drafted to the pros, I respect Bobby and all the attorneys who have been doing this watching for years. I want to just set a couple of things, just clarify a couple of things. The way this is a very, this is a very unique project. Uh, to Mr. Gillum's point, huh. it's an HVDC line. It is a it is a it is a technology that's all over the bulk of the world, but it's in very little little development here in North America, key parts of Canada and the U.S. It's a more expensive technology. It's a more efficient technology. What it really is is a a link or a conduit. Think of it like a toll road. What the way this would work and why it's being permitted. It's got its FERC approval. It's got its ERCOT approval. And it is building a toll road between multiple markets. And the cost associated with it is bore, borne completely by Pattern Energy, which is owned in majority by the Canadian Private Pension and Investment Board. That is with every public pensioner in, this, in the country of Canada, with the exception of folks in Quebec, where their retirement is. Sure Same entity is what owns uh, the majority of Calpine and other really big infrastructure companies. <laughs> this is a long, slow investment for the people of Canada in CPPIB. It's partially the reason why they allow us to spend decades and tremendous amounts of money to thoughtfully develop the line, which is partially the reason of I, I don't take it personal when someone doesn't like a project. I take it personal if someone thinks we're doing shady things or non-transparent. Like that's just, to me, that's the one thing I take personal in this. The confusion part of this is this project would be a bit of a balancing authority between a series of different entities. And the way that we would most likely see, one, we have to go through that formal process with FERC, that they supervise everything because we'd be this would be a common carrier line. The way that uh, utility A, let's just use a Louisiana utility A and Mississippi utility B, they would go through the same process. Because if you deliver electrons, that, and our proposed terminus is at the very end of MISO South. I think it's load zone eight, I want to say, something like that. Mississippi. Mississippi. So it's in MISO South. But if you can deliver, similar to Texas, if you can deliver into one part of ERCOT, you can deliver the vast majority of Texas. Same thing with this portion of MISO South. If you can deliver into this most eastern port of MISO South. You can go into South. You, you go to Southern or TVA? Or no, you can't. Not that. That would be a different phase. Okay. But you could, by delivering into Choc electrons or electricity into Cho uh, to Choctaw County, you could then flow without wheeling fees or wheeling charges by coordinating with the utilities. So let's pretend utility A in Louisiana and utility B in, Louis in Mississippi have the same ownership or whatnot. 
you could actually coordinate power through all those different utilities in the Southeast that are affiliates. And it would look like a power purchase agreement, a PPA. And part of what that PPA would include is what we would call the, let's call it the export tariff to pay to get over the line and out of Texas. And that opens up the ability for all of the electricity in Texas, which is mostly natural gas, wind, solar, coal, nuke, everything. But the bulk of it is new build natural gas, which is extremely affordable and clean. That is then opening up a, a, a conduit so that utilities here in other parts of the country could say, great, we want to buy this much to help augment in-state solar, in-state gas, all these different things. In times of need, and it's most of Texas and most of Louisiana and Mississippi have very different windows of peak operation in times of need. Mm. So in times of need, we've modeled this out using publicly available DOE data and utilities gate grade data, there would be the opportunity for utilities in the Southeast to willingly, if they choose to, sell their power at a premium cost into ERCOT. As a Houstonian who was without power for seven days and water for 10, uh, the ability to have had a back door into a functioning grid, unlike ours in ERCOT, would have been a lifesaver. I don't know the specific stat, but hundreds of Texans died because of Winter Storm Uri, because the grid was down. This would also allow, and again, it's not required, but utilities could say, great, we have excess power here in the Southeast, like Louisiana, we will sell that power into ERCOT at a premium. That then comes back and can go into the, however the utility wants to spend it. But we see this as a, a key link. But the hard part and the frustrating part, and I do understand commissioners why it's like, you're not delivering this into Louisiana. It's frustrating because the grid doesn't have the same boundaries that, that states do. But, I, but by delivering into MISO South, we are able to not have those fees. The frustrating part about all this, and I, the MISO people are saints in their own ways, all independent system operators are, they have had one of the largest series of uh, generator interconnect processes in the last few years. We submitted three 500 megawatt interconnection requests in September of 2022. MISO is still studying those. We put down, I think, $16 million of study costs for them to then bill to and study. They are behind schedule, but I think the goal is they're gonna be getting those out this year. That's step number one in all of this because MISO at the end of the day is the sole arbiter of reliability for the grid. And then they obviously work hand in glove with commissions. They're gonna come back and say, yeah, you know what, Southern Spirit, the max you could potentially deliver into MISO South as a region for reliability purposes is 1,000 megawatts, not 1,500. And that's an answer we have to take or leave. They may come back and say, you can deliver none into it. Our system can't handle it. That's another thing that we will then have to take or leave. Mm -hmm. In that process, they will also assign us and we are on the record fully committing to everywhere. I'll do a blood oath right here if it helps. Whatever costs MISO tells us are required to integrate that DC tie connection in Choctaw, we will pay. And if it's too rich for our blood, so to speak, that's the end of the project. And I absolutely agree with Commissioner Scrimetta, Commissioner Campbell, keeping landowners happy is item number one. This is a 325 mile intrastate transmission line. And I was probably being general by one. I, it's a very small handful. And I take pride in the fact that we're whittling that down. And I will channel Shannon Gwynn, who is, uh, lives in Baskin uh, and from Woodsboro up in Northeast uh, Louisiana. And she will say that like, keeping landowners involved in this process is critical. And like, I have spent enough time in the last decade in North, Eastern Louisiana to understand that it is a community that takes time to build trust and it is also one of the most <coughs> loving but disadvantaged places I've had the opportunity to work. We had a landowner in East Carroll Parish a few months back, got their first check for our option free fee. I'll keep names down, but approximately $60,000. This landowner broke into tears of joy said I make around $30,000 a year. This allowed me to get two years of salary right now. This is a game changer. And I know that that's not always the stories and the people that we're dealing with 
don't usually have the time or the ability to reach out to other commissioners. And at the end of the day, Mr. Belton is the one who had been, he and I and others, ev over every single parish of the life of the project. I told Back you. Back in 2018, sir, we did get a support resolution from he each and every parish. He also, time out, wait, let him get through talking. And we are refreshing those. And you are absolutely right. There have been parish, there have been a handful of parishes that are holding yeah. off on providing support. Yeah, and that is completely reasonable. The project has changed a bit. And at the end of the day, my job is to help get that as a developer, get that support. I, don't, I do not understand. I, got, I, I appreciate all you're saying. But I got a little mixed communication with you, Mr. Marino. First, you said you didn't have a problem. Now you've got a problem because you've come before Brandon and them and got the, got the blessing that we don't have any jurisdiction. Yeah, a lot of times that Y'all gave that, them that. that, that that's, that's pending before the ALJ. Right, I, I don't, we no, can't no, 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 no. No. I talked to you, Brandon. I talked to him. They came here and he said, you're not under the Public Service Commission. That was the first thing right out of the bat. Kyle, you told me that. We're not under the Public Service Commission. And that's what the, the staff told him here. When are you no big deal. To You're not on the Public Service Commission. You absolutely told me that. What, what time period? You're not here at the table or previously? Not at the table, Kyle. No. I'm telling you, when I started talking to you about the project, you, saw, you said, look, we talked to staff. They got no problems because you're not, we don't have any jurisdiction. That's exactly what you told me. That's accurate, but I mean, I didn't say it in any kind of, you know, negative way or... Well, well it's accurate. Just nod your head like no, that. No, it's I told accurate. You that. That's all you got to do. That, that the commission staff told me we weren't, but, you know, ultimately we, work, on said. our own, the company decided to file and ask for certification. I, I got it, but what troubles me and still troubles me, I didn't like the staff saying we don't have any jurisdiction. That's second gear. That's that's when you went. Say from we first have to jurisdiction a lot. Now to get down in third gear in the old car that you can go on down the road, I asked you, do you object now? But you do object because you said what? I went to the staff, and they didn't object, and now you're coming in. That's going to put a monkey wrench in it. That's what I'm getting out of the argument, and that is not correct. I never, I never said I was for it. I think I can try to clear. You told me that, well, that we don't have any jurisdiction. But we do have jurisdiction. Commissioner, I want to be very clear. Again, we filed for certification, not, not saying, hey, no. we're exempt. We filed <laughs> for certification under Louisiana law, when any we kind of any file. kind of matter, whether it's here in the courts, you can make alternative filings, alternative claims. And so we said, hey, I we want to get certified or declare us exempt well, well, I got a question for you. in there. I got a question for you. If that's the case, I wanna, I wanna you don't have any objection to it, do you? We can end this argument just like that. I've All said you multiple do times I don't have objection to the rulemaking. I don't think it applies to us. Oh, well, okay. Well, wait, wait. I don't think it applies to us, but I don't think it matters because we already asked you for certification. So what would it matter if you changed the rule to say, hey. So what are you going to do if we change the rules and you don't get the votes? What are you going to do then, Kyle? Go to the court. company will make a decision. I'm an attorney that does Louisiana regulatory work. It's a lot more than me. So the company will make a decision. I'm not here to. Well, I know. can tell you what the company's going to do. Okay. I can tell you exactly what you're going to do. If we bring it up, you get three people here, three, that says that I think that we ought to have to certify this if it comes across the state. You've already got certification. That's what he's saying, isn't it? You've got certification. We turn you down, you know exactly what you're going to do, go to court. Say, hey, they don't matter. We've got, we've well, already got it. And let's, let's, let's just, I just want to say one thing for the record. This is all hypothetical because if we're saying which way we're voting, that could be an issue down the road uh, without the ALJ recommendation. I want, I want a deal well, I'm, not, I'm just saying, if you, uh, anyway, I'm hey, you ready to go? Let's go. Move to adjourn. <laughs> Have it. it I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Somebody second it. Let's go. I'll, 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 I'll both. <laughs> we stand, we stand to Jerry. <laughs>